and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. I have a very special guest today, and I say that because before the pandemic, I was a conference producer. I produced 19 conferences, and I heard a bunch of speakers, and today's guest was really at the top of the list as so many people's favorite, and one of mine including, and I know he deeply moved Dr. John McDougall at one of the McDougall Advanced Study Weekends, even made Dr. McDougall cry, and that is not an easy thing to do. He is the author of two amazing books called Comfortably Unaware and Sustainability and Food Choice, and he was the lead consultant in two incredible documentaries, Cowspiracy and Species. Seaspiracy, excuse me, I misspoke. Please welcome to the show. I'm so glad he's back doing lectures again, Dr. Richard Ophenlander. Well, really kind introduction, uh, AJ. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. And I want to take just a quick moment to thank you for uh, all, all the great messaging that you have over the years. You've done so much for so many people. So, anyway, thank you. This is my opportunity to slide that in. Well, thank you. You know, people maybe are not, all people are not familiar with all of your work, but before you even talk about how you got into being the lead consultant for these incredible documentaries, when did you first adopt a plant-based diet and why? Because that's not something I hear you have talked about a lot. No, no, it isn't. I don't get asked that very often. They just assume, well, you know, he's been at it a long time. So, so really in summary fashion, uh, I, I was involved in quite a bit of medical research in graduate school and realized that from mostly a human health standpoint, I started seeing what, what changes in, in different uh, nutrients did to, to cellular growth or death. And uh, it's mostly in the laboratory. And then I started, oh, expounding on that a little bit and, and seeing what it would do to what it, how, how actually our food choices impacted our own human health. And then, uh, you know, being a quite a curious type, inquisitive type, I then started looking at agricultural systems and how food was produced and then started seeing, of course, what we did to animals behind the scenes. So I have the, you know, the typical, you know, tripod of, of um, influences, but it started back in graduate school and, and I just decided yeah, that's it and we're not going to do it anymore for, for all the reasons that we know of today. The only difference is it was maybe 50, it was like 48, 50 years ago when I was in graduate school. So I hate to, I hate to say that, I hate to date, date myself, but you know, it seems like it was uh, just yesterday, but it was quite a while ago. Wow. Well, you look, I mean, that uh, you look amazing. Did, why do we, why do you oh, think other doctors just don't g g learn what you've learned? Right. So there is, there are a couple different, that's a great question. There are a couple different layers uh, of, of answering to that. One is that, you know, they really don't have, you know, they get, they have an, an amassing of information that they have to um, encounter and go through just to become a, a doctor, whatever they are. And so in, in most cases, we already know, most people know this, but nutrition and dietary information just isn't there. And certainly anything related to food choice and the effects on our environment, environment is, is not there. It's not, it's not in anybody's, uh, on anybody's radar when they're in medical school. Secondly, is, is that then you, you, you just, um, you know, they graduate, they move on into their own practices. And um, there just isn't a lot of information out there. In fact, that's one of the reasons I wrote my first book, uh, Comfortably Unaware, is because, you know, I saw that, you know, there were tremendous, you know, physicians and different um, um, scientists with, uh, that were uh, discussing and quite, quite in tune to the effects of food choice on human health, but not the environment. And then after Al Gore received the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for the Inconvenient Truth, I started realizing that, you know, hey, there's one little paragraph in his book of like 350 pages that discuss very briefly and somewhat tangentially about um, the effect of or that that cattle or livestock may have some impact. And I realized, hey, you know, if this if this guy's out there, you know, making all this change for uh, climate change and global warming, but is not including uh, our environment and food choices, then uh, as food choices apply, then there's something wrong. So that's when I really became quite, quite deeply involved is when I realized that, you know, the, the media and public at large and scientists just don't know that much about food choice and the environment, or they knew, knew some know about it and they just didn't want to they didn't want to project it because it was too difficult for them. But Al Gore has gone vegan, right? Okay, so that's a that's an interesting topic, and that one leads to a lot of other discussions that we can talk about maybe at the end of my presentation because he's he's obviously got a, a large platform of influence, 
But the issue is, is that um, he's a uh, he's a publicly, uh, you know, it's it's what's convenient for him. Uh, for instance, he owns a 400 acre farm just east of Nashville in Middle Tennessee that um, engages in very heavy regenerative agriculture. So he raises and slaughters and um, four or five different types of animals and, and uh, promotes that. And so whether he actually, yeah, exactly, it's a head shaking type of thing. Uh, and so whether he eats that or not, I, you know, I would really doubt that he does not eat that, but I'm not in a position to really, you know, to say, but he's a heavy promoter of the meat and dairy industry right now. Wow. You know, yeah, you it know, is. Because uh, huh. I, I actually ran into him once. I didn't speak to him, but he was at a vegan restaurant. And so I kind of assumed maybe he was. Yeah, well, you know, he first became uh, introduced and became at least publicly, the, the public was aware of him potentially becoming vegan after Bill Clinton had the heart, you know, the uh, heart attacks and had some issues and, and, uh, and then pronounced that he was becoming vegan. So it was more from a di his own dietary health standpoint. But, you know, the fact is, is that if he goes home every night and gets excited about raising and, and slaughtering animals on us and, and producing, you know, uh, animal products from his farm, I, I, I don't know, you know, it's like, even if he didn't eat those, it's a huge conflict of interest. Well, you know, it's funny because I, 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 I have spoken in places where people have, uh, been vegan for health reasons, but not ethical reasons. Like, like, you know, actually like a dairy farmer that had to go vegan for his health, but still continued to be a dairy farmer, for example. Right. Or I actually knew an exterminator, a man that owned an extermination company, but went vegan for his heart health. So I, the mm -hmm. ethical methods and the health message don't always go together for some people. No, they don't. But, you know, with, with Al Gore, for instance, um, I don't know about the, the examples you gave, but for Al Gore, for instance, um, he certainly knows very well the implications of or the footprint that we have by eating high up on the food chain animal products to the, the to global warming and, and hence climate change. And here he won the Nobel Peace Prize based on that, you know, on that on that subject. So he, you know, above all, should certainly know the, you know, the implications of eating meat and what it does to in terms of climate change. Um, so huge conflict of interest. Can't yeah, say much more when, about it. But it's hard when people, that's when they, when that's how they make their living. Sometimes it's hard to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But I have a lot of ideas that you'll see in my presentation. There, there are ways that, that, uh, economics can play a large part of this. There, there is money, uh, and economics and livelihoods that, uh, can be even created by moving into plant-based systems. Yeah. You know, you're both comfortably unaware. Do you think that there really are some people that just are, are unaware that they really just don't know the, the gravity mm -hmm. of the situation? Well, another great question. You're full of great questions today. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So actually I wrote that first book. I mean, it was um, over a decade ago and I, I, I did believe early two thousands, I mean, 1990s to, you know, and before uh, that, uh, right. It was an educational issue. Now I believe that it's not, it's not all an educational issue. I believe that there are so many different influences uh, for uh, people with platforms uh, that uh, of influence that um, they just don't want to, you know, they don't want to um, promote it. Uh, it's a conflict of interest. Again, look at Al Gore. Um, but similarly with uh, just about anybody else. I mean, they, they, there's, a, there's a large contradiction for most people. I think they are aware and they're afraid of losing their, their, their influence. They're afraid of losing their, their audience. You know, speaking of audience, when we talk about climate change or the environment, because I've had some wonderful speakers on this show, we don't get as many views as when we have a doctor talking about losing weight or reversing heart disease. And or if we have a chef doing a demo, it seems that or, or even just like in Renuka for PETA, people do not seem to care as much mm -hmm. about the environment or the ethical component of veganism mm -hmm. as they do the health, or at least the people that are, seem right. to be watching my show. And I'm wondering, is it because it's so far out in our future, the devastation of the climate that we can't even imagine it now? Right. So, you know, really wonderful prelude to, again, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about here in the presentation. But yeah, a couple of things about that. One is that um, I have always said, and everyone needs to take this to heart, that it really doesn't matter how healthy we are if our planet's not healthy. I mean, it, it, it may matter to you because it's right in front of you at this point in time. But, you know, as we pass through, we, we really need to leave this planet in a, as well or in a healthier condition than when we than when we arrived. And if we're only concerned about ourselves and you know, we, we aren't aware of or we're aware and just want to downplay or dismiss 
the effect that our food choices have on the environment, then that's, I think that, you know, that's too bad. That's, that's, I think should be number one on our list. You know, what, what we can do for future generations and current generations of all species, you know, we're, we're, and we'll talk about that in the presentation as well, but we're, we're, we're basically responsible for, you know, the extermination or extinction of so many different species. And um, I, I think that that, that lays should lay heavily on everybody's mind, even even if they don't care about their own health or they do care about their own health as the number one priority. I think that we need to start switching that around to to make sure that our environment plays a, a heftier role. Yeah. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing to enlighten people. <laughs> I wish I. I mean, but you can't you can't legislate like caring. You know, you you, no. you can't make people care. No, you can't. But I mean, the, the door's been open um, because I mean, I, I had this discussion with my brother, who's a uh, who's uh, you know basically involved heavily in business and the business end of of living. And I mean, he likes to have fun too. But you know, his line is, you know, if it doesn't affect my pocketbook or it's not right in front of me, you know, I'm not going to change type thing. Um, and so I think what we have to do is is continue educating. But also, there's there's a number of different levels that we can we can you know, create um, th that uh, will, uh, will help the situation quite a bit. I mean, for instance, the example I gave him is that um, no one's really buying uh, electric cars. Right? Everyone's buying electric cars. That's why Tesla, that's why Elon Musk has the income that he has. But no one's buying electric cars necessarily because it's an economic uh, of economic interest to them because it's not, it's actually more expensive in many ways, at least in the Midwest. And by the time you buy your car and you know, the infrastructure is not there, et cetera, et cetera. They're buying it because it, it, most people today, and this is what I mean by the, the foots, you know, the doors open slightly. Most people today have some knowledge of climate change, at least. And climate change is, is not the principal issue or, or excuse me, uh, it's not the principal problem we should be concerned about. It's all the other aspects of what I call global depletion. And also the gas and oil industry is not the main contributor to, uh, to all these areas of environmental concern. And I'll talk about that in our presentation as well. So I think just people, people need to know that. And then, and then likely they could take some of their interest in, that they have in electric cars and transfer that into food choice. And that's, that's my hope. At least it's a lot different now than it was you know, 20 years ago when I first started talking about this. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see your presentation. You're such a wonderful speaker. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I try. I, I, I try to give as much information as, as I can. And I hope your, your audience will sit through it a little bit because I, I really had to distill this down from about three, three or four hours of a couple of lectures down to maybe an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, something like that. Well, I am ready whenever you are. Oh, well, great. AJ. I really appreciate that. Let's see if I can get this going then. Um, all right. We practice this, so just hit screen share. We have, we practice it. Okay. Just a shout out from Linda Middlesworth. Please tell him I'm his biggest fan. <laughs> oh my goodness. She's so sweet. Okay, so uh, real quickly, I've got screen share on Chef AJ, but it's not. There it is. It, 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 you just, got it? it did it for a second, then it went away. Okay, so let me click this on for you. Just make Let's sure it, screen. it's on your, just sure, make sure. Yep, perfect. You got it. Okay, and then we're going to view that. And I'm gonna click this. We have practice, and you'd think that yeah. I could do this. Let me, um, let me stop this just for a second, Chef AJ. And That's then, okay. Take your time. Yeah, I want to make sure we get it quite where I want it. And That's weird. It is because it's, uh, let me drop this down a little bit. PowerPoint. Yeah, so hold that thought a minute. 
Yeah, I'll just read some of the comments while you're doing it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Jean says, the planet, the ecosystems are very important to me. Thank you for inviting Dr. Richard Openlender on Chef AJ. And uh, Miss Sunrise says, Chef AJ, I hope I'm wrong, but I just don't think everyone can be vegan. And the messaging is usually that you have to go vegan or else you're a hypocrite when talking about the environment. And yeah, because I will ask Dr. Openlander what he thinks about the reducitarian movement when he is. And guys, please share this broadcast in real time. We really appreciate it. There's a share button wherever you're watching. Okay, let's see if I can start this over again. I just got moved off of my uh, off my screen there. Okay, we there? That is perfect. Okay, all right, we're ready to go ready to rock and roll. Okay, here we go. All right. Well, once again, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thank all of you for taking the time to tune in today. It's certainly an honor for me to be here. Let's, uh, let's begin. Many of us have had a difficult time over the past few years. My, my wife and I lost our wonderful son, Ty, to a, a very aggressive brain tumor. And so I had to step away five years ago from my duties to save our planet in order to help try to save our, our son. All, all quite terribly sad, but we must go on. And of course, I'm going to take just a moment because our hearts and prayers need to continue going out to those in Ukraine where their lives have been drastically changed forever. Knowing and, and doing. Well, this is Earth, the, the planet we live on. And of course, there, there is only one Earth. It's, it's been here for four and a half billion years with life thriving on it for three billion years. Hominids, such as Australopithecus, came into the picture at about four million years ago. And our species, Homo sapiens, separated, our, uh, separated ourselves out from that group at around 300,000 to 800,000 years ago. We'll put into perspective our planet and life on it's been here for for quite some time, four billion years before we were. Agriculture and civilization began about 6,000 to 10,000 years ago when we started domesticating animals and plants uh, and began cutting down trees and forests. And then industrialization took place with factories popping up everywhere, everywhere in the mid 1800s to early 1900s. So with this extraordinarily long history of life balancing itself so very well in somewhat of a Gaia, you know, natural manner for so very long on our planet, we humans came along and began the path toward creating some serious damage to our planet, to ourselves, and to other species in only the last 150 years. A snapshot of our planet today reveals this. We're, we're running out of land and fresh water. Pollution and human-induced greenhouse gas emissions are threatening our atmosphere and waterways and negatively affecting our climate. Our oceans and sea life are being destroyed. We're losing habitat, ecosystems, and biodiversity with mass extinctions occurring at a rate that we haven't seen since the dinosaurs were lost 65 million years ago. 950 million people in the world are suffering from hunger. One half of our topsoil has been lost with areas becoming completely desertified. All this while we witness escalating rates of emerging and chronic disease regarding our own human health. Well, there's some scientists who predict that, that time's running out for us as a thriving species. We may only have 50 to 100 years left before things become quite bleak. And these are researchers, they're not doomsdayers. I call all this global depletion, the loss of our primary resources on earth, as well as our own health. It's still about sustainability. I just think we need to hear it from a different direction. We need to hear the whole story through an unfiltered lens. And for me, the story is constantly changing from one of needing to simply increase awareness, as Chef Jay, AJ and I were talking about a minute ago, to one of stopping an aggressive cancer that's quickly consuming all of us. But, but there is a way. These are just some of the many timelines confronting us. For instance, phosphorus and nitrogen balance is irreversibly altered today. Oceanic warming is predicted to continue with rising seas for centuries from now, even if we stop all greenhouse gases from all fossil fuel use today. 240 million acres of tropical rainforest will be destroyed by the year 2030 and mostly replaced by livestock and crops to feed them. Well, we have six recognized 
categories of generations of humans living right now. The, the, the younger Z and alpha generations are over there at their right. And the millennials uh, have the highest population with the highest population in the middle. And over the far left, we have the greatest generation. And, and we have a daunting task, I think, in front of us today regarding this environment issue to first realize that we're, that we're damaging our planet to what extent and then how to somehow fix it. When I step back and look at this, I see a picture of tremendous responsibility, opportunity, though, of profound historical magnitude. Although even children can certainly be leaders on behalf of our planet, it's really it's really my generation and the generation of our adult children, those three or four generations in the middle here that are in a strong or strongest leadership position today. We're in a unique situation to save Earth as we know it and save life on it now and allow a livable future for those coming after us who are, or we could ignore things, act like nothing's happening or when we get around to it and allow it to continue on its current path to possibly be destroyed. Now, what's at stake? The extinguishing of our own species and thousands of other species, we can essentially make or break humanity that could be at stake. And if you think that this is a, an overstatement, um, a wild exaggeration, or that this problem is entirely related to climate change, well, then that that doubt, that skepticism, and that lack of awareness uh, all become part of the problem. So certainly something needs to change. What is it that we're doing to our environment? What needs to change? And importantly, how fast does this change need to take place? The answers to those questions are easy, I think. We need to stop those practices and habits that we administer every single day on a collective basis globally that create an unnecessary and proportionately large resource footprint, beginning with the largest footprint of all, food, what we eat, and our agricultural systems. It's a larger resource guzzler than anything else we do. It also happens to be the very easiest to change. Well, um, okay, um, as opposed to mandated uh, like global population control or the culling of other humans to get us down to a manageable 3 billion mark as we were in 1950, that's not gonna happen. And it's a weak argument to the continued destruction actually that, that the ones here on earth are doing. We also aren't gonna see the immediate elimination of all fossil fuel use. That isn't gonna happen anytime soon. And you know what, even if it, even if it does happen, it really wouldn't address a number of aspects of global depletion. It simply won't. You'll see that as we go along today. Well, how quickly do we need to change our habits, our footprint? I can tell you this, it's not a time for baby steps because it needs to be done right now. It needs to be done today. We're on very real timelines and it's much worse now than it was five years ago when I last made this call to action for everyone. But let's take a closer look at all this and, and see what it really means. Well, many of the choices you make in life will have a profound impact on something else in the world, especially with things you consume like food. It's one of the major disconnects we, we seem to live with. What you do here might affect something over there something that, again, Chef AJ and I were talking about just a few minutes ago, how to look outside the microcosm or the bubble that each of us tends to live in and, and then how to encourage others to do the same. Well, again, I became very concerned about what sustainability really does mean and began looking at these food choices and agricultural systems quite some time ago. So, so uh, I, again, I stopped eating processed foods and I stopped eating animals while I was in graduate school. And that was, again, about 50 years ago. And since then, I've spent tens of thousands of hours researching farms, cultures, ideologies, and the effect we have on our planet by way of, of food production. I've been researching just so many factory farms, but also as well as various grazing or grass fed systems, fish farms, cage free, large and small operations in the United States and in many, many countries overseas, learning and of course, always questioning. Got my little microphone there for, from this point forward, I'm spending most of my time trying to align governments, academic institutions, think tanks, and funding or financing organizations, all those that are in a position to move the critical mass forward in a positive manner. It's my goal to get everyone on the same page regarding our environment and to do this very quickly. At the beginning of the sustainability equ equation is that word itself, sustainable, which is now seen everywhere. but this word is typically misused and it's ill-defined because rarely, if ever, is food choice properly connected to sustainability efforts, especially the raising and eating of animals, despite the enormous effect. It's, it's simply too challenging for everyone, it seems, culturally, socially. But this is the reason we're in a sustainability crisis today. 
as a global community, we've been too slow in realizing the state of unsustainability that we're in, vastly too slow in making that connection to animal agriculture, and we've been indifferent to act. And yet this word sustainable is the most important word in our vocabulary that we need to define accurately. Because, well, if we get this word wrong, if we get sustainable wrong, well, then the consequences aren't so good, are they? It's a little stark, but indeed civilizations have vanished based on how they used or misused their environment. And we're next in line, but this time is different because we're slowly taking down other species as well as ourselves as a global community. Well, as I mentioned, we humans have reached a, a critical and fragile point in our evolutionary journey as a species just in the past hundred years, really a blink of an eye, we've reached the Anthropocene era where we've acquired the power to negatively change our biosphere and geosphere, the cryo, hydro, and atmosphere. We're ruining the very environs that sustain all of us and all other life on earth. Unfortunately, we haven't acquired the wisdom or the maturity to be able to manage this power in a sensible or beneficial manner. In fact, six out of nine identified tipping points or planetary boundaries related to our life support systems on earth, six out of nine have already been passed. And all nine boundaries are interconnected. As one collapses, the others will soon follow. Well, a few years ago, a team of 28 internationally renowned scientists identified and quantified these planetary boundaries within which humanity can continue to develop and thrive for generations to come. However, crossing these boundaries will generate abrupt and irreversible damage to the environment and create risks for continued human existence. Well, once again, six out of nine of these boundaries have already been crossed. And with the other three boundaries, we're exceeding their tolerance levels. The boundaries that we've crossed are with loss of biosphere integrity and extinctions, already across it, land system change, we'll talk about that in a minute, altered biogeochemical flows, such as with phosphorus and nitrogen, climate change is one, accumulation of novel entities, which are microplastics, nanomaterials, and chemical pollution, we've already crossed that barrier, and the sixth boundary crosses ocean acidification. Now, I think this is a little too complicated for most people to quickly grasp. So I simply call all this global depletion, which is what I've been calling it for the past 20, 25 years. Well, the story for me always begins with these two numbers, though. There are just under 8 billion people living on our planet today with 200,000 net added every single day. So control of the growth of our population can be an issue, but it's not nearly the problem as the number on the right what we're doing to the planet. The number on the right represents the fact that there are more than 80 billion animals living on our planet that we raise and eat for food each year. And it repeats itself year after year in growing numbers. In fact, um, and that's the problem. In fact, this 80 billion number is quite impossible to pin down because it's very much on the light side. Um, these figures don't include up to 1.7 trillion chickens in the world or 2 trillion fish in the world that were slaughtered during that same year. Let's look at a graphic about global depletion. Certainly there are other industries that contribute to this picture, but, but none have the comprehensive impact as animal agriculture. Simply put, we're in overshoot mode, demanding more of our planet's resources than what it can supply. We've been in overshoot mode since 1973. Globally, it would take two full Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. Here in the United States, it would require five full Earths to support our current lifestyle. It's serious enough on its own merit, but it's made much more so because of the layers of various influences that tend to bury the problem and, and bury its solutions. And what's critical for everyone to understand that this isn't just an industrial or factory farm issue, not at all. It's a, it's a raising animals to eat issue in any capacity. And we're gonna see that as we go along. So let's continue refining our thoughts on global warming or climate change. First, we need to remember that global warming and climate change um, well, that's just one component of the much larger, more insidious problem of global depletion, the more total effect we have on our planet, and it's not all caused by the energy sector. Discussions regarding global warming and climate change have now taken front stage nearly, nearly everywhere. It must be remembered, though, that climate change will have the effects of exacerbation. It takes events and then makes matters worse. Global warming and climate change, for instance, will not be the initial cause of these categories of global depletion that you see on the screen. We cause these things. Climate change will worsen them. Well, these climate change reports were released very recently. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report uh, just a couple of months ago, documenting 
the work of over 450 scientists. And the reports are gloomy at best, where they were breaking a number of records, records we, we shouldn't be so proud of, finding that last year was the fifth warmest on record, despite being cooled for much of the beginning of the year by La Nina. And from 2013 through this year, rank as the 10 warmest years on record. Global, global temperatures now reached a 1.2 degree centigrade rise above pre-industrial times. That's a new record. Concentration of greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere reached 420 parts per million. That's a new record. Oceans are now rising over four millimeters per year, having risen faster and becoming warmer and more acidic than ever in recorded history. In fact, the oceans are becoming more acidic at a faster rate than ever seen in the past 56 million years. Well, many of us understand that climate change is real. You, you understand and appreciate the implications of unabated global, global warming and that we humans play an important role in becoming resilient and adapting to it. But instead of just becoming resilient to climate change or adapting to it, I, I would suggest that we all understand some simple unfiltered basics of what really causes climate change because it affects all of us and we're all affecting it. And then how to most easily and effectively solve the problem. And then what realistic timelines we're confronted with. And then we need to reverse it. The basics look like this. Our planet's warming in, a, in an accelerated fashion, which then causes our climate to change. Seems pretty simple. The more it warms, the more drastic our climate and temperatures and weather patterns will be. Well, this global warming is due to excessive greenhouse gases that are produced on Earth. Some are from natural causes, though, from like from volcanoes, wetlands, Arctic tundra, oceans. But our planet's always had a beautiful way of balancing out those small amounts that have been produced historically by simply sequestering or, or drawing down these gases back into the land and oceans. Except whenever this became drastically imbalanced, such as millions of years ago, and caused mass extinctions. But significant Im imbalancing and significant greenhouse gas uh, imbalance is actually happening today, again. Until around 1750 to 1850, that's a time referred to as pre-industrial, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions produced naturally on Earth has always been around 17 to 29 gigatons per year. It's always been about that every year. Since the 1850s, though, we humans, through our everyday actions and choices, are now creating more than two to three times that much each year, around 39 to 64 gigatons per year. And our planet, because of this, has warmed by that 1.2 degrees centigrade since pre-industrial times, since 1850. So this excess greenhouse gas accumulation in our atmosphere is what's causing global warming. The three gases most associated with global warming are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Well, since carbon dioxide is the most prevalent in terms of the emitted gases at just under 75%, and it's mostly caused by burning of fossil fuels, gas, oil, coal, it has become the focal point, the center of attention of all the efforts of all those who, who know that we need to address climate change, businesses, policymakers, or the media. Let's go after carbon dioxide. But that's not the, the gas we should be most focused on necessarily. Today at nearly 2,000 parts per billion, three times what it was in 1850, methane is responsible for 30% of the rise we've seen in global warming since pre-industrial times. So here's the catch on that. 60% of all methane emissions are from human activities. And furthermore, livestock, animal agriculture, is responsible for nearly half of all human-induced methane emissions globally, more than gas, more than oil, more than coal. Methane is 86 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a global warming agent over a 20-year time frame. And in fact, at the point of initial emission of meth methane is 120 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Well, carbon dioxide stays in our atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years, but, but methane breaks down shortly after 10 years, and then it turns into carbon dioxide and water vapor, both greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, and it hangs out longer. And despite the pandemic during the year 2020, we witnessed the largest one-year jump in methane emissions on record, even though we weren't traveling as much and burning fossil fuels, but we were consuming meat. So to stop further climate change, we need to drop human-induced greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide, but from all sources we're emitting today. But drop it down to what? Well, all climate change organizations and experts today believe we need to cut emissions to one half of what they were just a couple of years ago in 2020 by the year 2030. And to get to zero net emissions by the year 2050. That's what the buzz is. But others, including me, believe that's too late. 
So the first step is to be clear on where most of these human produced greenhouse gases are coming from what industries, what sectors are the largest emitters, and then there should be swift action to stop them from emitting. The second issue would be what happens to all that extra carbon dioxide that's still left in the atmosphere and will likely be there for the next few hundreds of years. Well, we've got some answers there. We've got some solutions. We've got some ways to manage that. Let's first attack those largest emitters of greenhouse gases today. Who are they? Well, these numbers tried to answer that question. And when they were first published, started a bit of controversy. How could the meat everyone's eating cause more greenhouse gas emissions than what's caused by powering all the cars, trucks, planes, and, and, and trains that we drive and fly every day? But instead of 18%, as that original 2006 United Nations report stated, or even their most recent figure of 14.5%, a couple of researchers found that livestock could produce as much as, well, as much as 51% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. Now, most Scientific organizations are not on board with this figure yet, but there are a number of reasons for the differences in these numbers from low to high. Most important for me is the vast underreporting in that 2006 United Nations report. They, they did not use accurate global warming potential for methane. They used 21 instead of 86 or 120. These reports also failed to factor in all the greenhouse gases emitted because of our demand to eat fish the fuel refrigeration, processing, packaging, transportation. And there's profound bias amongst the authors of those reports who are well-known consultants for the livestock industry. And the bias continues today. But again, all these authors have very deep ties, as you can see, what I circled here, they have very deep ties to the meat and dairy industries. These lower numbers of 18 and 14.5% for the livestock industry also didn't factor in uh, land use optimization, or what could be referred to as carbon opportunity cost, how land might be used more carbon and methane efficiently. With these costs positioned into the equation, many could argue that animal agriculture is indeed responsible for minimally between 37 and 51 percent. In fact, my good colleague, uh, Dr. Silas Rao, has recently eloquently proposed that animal agriculture may be responsible for even 87 percent of all global human-induced greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore the leading cause of climate change. Regardless of where the exact number resides, somewhere between 14.5 or 51% or even 87%, with all factors considered, it's cause for alarm and it's cause for immediate action. A perfect example of how all this information is suppressed occurs every single year during our climate change conferences called the, the Conference of the Parties held originally in Kyoto with its 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Last year is the 26th yearly conference held in Glasgow. This year it's gonna be held in Morocco where countries come together and they're trying to solve this global warming problem, but none of this that you see at the bottom of the slides being addressed. The focus once again today is on fossil fuel reduction, no regard to livestock, even though animal agriculture is the largest emitter of human induced methane in the world at around 44%. Gas and oil is 23, coal is 12. Taking this a step further, our government enacted this emissions reduction plan. This is a plan whereby $17 billion is gonna be used to help the, meet the goal of reducing US methane emissions. But all this is targeted at the gas and oil industry. Now, do they need to be penalized? Sure, but they're not the problem. The only thing mentioned in this entire action plan is to reduce methane in the agricultural sector is, well, they're going to set up a research committee to further assess the situation. That's gonna go well. So here's what I propose based on what the planet desperately needs regarding methane. Precise and complete accounting methods, which we do not have now globally for the production of methane by the end of this year. Then mandated education. Everyone needs to know about the reality of climate change, the dire timelines, the factual impact of animal agriculture and solutions. And then we set bars for emissions of methane to be cut by 50% across all sectors by the year 2027 and to 0% by the year 2030. It can be done. And those industries and individual farmers and businesses that succeed in doing this would receive tax breaks. And those that don't would have strict penalties imposed, just like what's being proposed by the methane reduction plan that's already enacted. All this is gonna be funded by the reallocation of government money already set aside that's targeting the gas and oil industry. Well, every aspect of global depletion has a timeline. It's not really a question of if we're going to run out of something, it's when at our current pace. One of the most critical timelines of all is that of climate change. Uh, climate scientists believe we've already passed our timeline because now it's more a matter of, of, of how to minimize uh, the change in climate that we've already set into motion and thereby minimize future damage. 
And it does appear dire when we view just how much greenhouse gas uh, we've, or gases we've dumped into our atmosphere since 1850. Carbon dioxide levels have always been hovering around 277 parts per million for the past 10,000 years. That's the green line you see across the bottom. It's, that represents 10,000 years at about 277 parts per million. And then at the right, it shoots up uh, dramatically and look what happened, we're at 420 parts per million. So the first goal would be to drop our emissions as we were talking about a minute ago, so that we're not contributing to this any further. And then the second goal would be to get rid of all that extra carbon dioxide that we've emitted since the 1800s. Otherwise it just hangs out, out longer and causes more climate issues. Well, how do we do that? Well, we could use some geoengineering and spray some material into our atmosphere to block the sun's rays, uh, like some are suggesting and spending quite a bit of money on trying to to, uh, to perfect, or perhaps we could use some high technology and build machines that could extract the excess carbon dioxide and bury it beneath the ground, like this company is starting to do in Iceland. But one of these, just one of these single units costs $15 million and would require a projected 100 million of these units worldwide to pull down the extra carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And it would take approximately 75 to 100 years to simply scale up to produce this many, these many units. So relying on, this, relying on this type of technological approach, it would cost us uh, about one quadrillion dollars, and it would take till the end of the century to be fully effective. And this won't address any other aspect of global depletion. Uh, I don't even know what one, one quadrillion dollars is. So, so I have another, another approach. And before I tell you about this, this plan, we also need to take a quick look at our planet, how land is currently being used. 71% of our planet are, are, are tied up in oceans. 29% is, is land. Of all of our land, 71% of that 29% that's land, 71% is considered habitable. The rest being desert and glaciers. Well, one half of this habitable land is used for agriculture, one half. 11% is considered unusable shrubland and 1% is taken up by freshwater lakes and streams. Of all the land on earth used for agriculture, which is a little over 5 billion hectares, or that's about 20 million square miles, of all that land, almost 80% is used for animal agriculture. 80% land for grazing livestock and crops to feed them. Only 20% is used to grow plants for us to eat, but 82% of all the food calories eaten worldwide comes from that 20%. It's, a, it's astounding. And please pay, pay particular attention to the fact that what I just circled here on the screen, of, that only 1% of all habitable land on earth, only 1% is being used for urban development. So we certainly can't use urbanization or urban sprawl as an excuse uh, anymore for us running out of land. Again, the problem we have is not the number of people on earth, it's what we're eating. So now my solution to climate change. Once again, out of all the land on earth that's being used for agriculture, 80% is used for grazing livestock and crops to feed them. That's a little over 4 billion hectares. Well, many researchers now agree what I first uh, proposed over about a decade ago, that we could grow enough food to feed the human population today and into the next 20 years on less than 1 billion hectares, not not four or five billion. Thus, we can stop all animal agriculture, remove all livestock from all grazing lands, and convert those four billion plus hectares back to forest by reforestation or just natural regeneration, rewilding. Short term, over the next five to seven years, this would meet and exceed every country's methane reduction pledge. And by 2050, with more than four billion hectares reforested, we would be able to sequester or pull down all those excessive greenhouse gases, all that excessive carbon dioxide of where we are today at 420 parts per million, closer to the historic levels of 277, where we were for the past 10,000 years and our earth was healthier. It's a beautifully simple plan. Well, inspired by the 1977 Green Belt Movement, the, the World Wildlife Fund joined a couple other international movements in 2018 to begin the Plant a Trillion Trees program, which many of you have probably heard about. It then became a much larger movement two years ago when the World Economic Forum uh, created One T for One Trillion Trees, an initiative for businesses, governments, and civil society to support this. Well, it's a wonderful idea superficially and on some levels, but it's not so good on many other levels. 
The goal is to uh, for the world to plant one trillion trees by the year 2030. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, nowhere in their mission statements is there mention or emphasis on food choice, eliminating meat and dairy from one's diet. And yet that's the primary reason we need to plant trees, isn't it? We've been eating the wrong food all these years and had to cut down forests because we're running out of land to support this bizarre animal breeding and killing diet. That's, that's the reason we need to plant trees. Planting one trillion trees initially sounds good, but it's essentially meaningless if the world continues to eat animals and animal products and thereby continues to deforest or misuse our resources while we're running around planting trees. Now this movement also over focuses on planting a certain number of trees rather than placing focus where it needs to be, which again is to stop eating meat, stop deforesting, and then properly restore all grazed land, all deforested land back to their near original state, regardless of how many trees it takes. For instance, if we restored the 4 billion hectares I was talking about, used for grazing livestock with plant-based agroforestry or simple natural regeneration, well, after 10 to 20 years, there'd likely be 2,000 trees growing per hectare multiplied by 4, 4 billion hectares, which would equal 8 trillion trees, not 1 trillion. And this could potentially sequester and draw down between 108 and 181 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases per year. It's astounding. Well, then there are mangroves. W what are those? These are critical coastal ecosystems that buffer communities against extreme weather events. They're so very important. They slow down erosion. They foster so much wildlife and biodiversity. And next to peatlands, mangroves store more carbon than any other vegetation on Earth. Well, we've lost half of the world's mangroves in just the last 50 years, 32 million hectares. Now, more than half of this terrible loss is due to aquaculture and shrimp farming. And mangroves can pull down or sequester four times more carbon dioxide from our atmosphere than what tropical rainforests do. So they're very, very important. So let's stop eating shri shrimp, stop eating fish from aquaculture settings and begin reforesting the 32 million hectares of mangroves, which would then sequester another four gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gases per year. So how important is food choice and climate change then? We're currently pumping in, again, around 64 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases each year. And if we converted all global cropland that's currently growing crops to feed livestock and converted all pasture land, as we were discussing with grazing livestock, converted all that to plant-based agroforestry systems, producing food for us to eat directly, we find ourselves at a net negative greenhouse gas scenario, complete mitigation. And, and all the excessive greenhouse gases that we pumped in over the last 200 years would be pulled down. This would bring back wildlife, biodiversity, protect our soil, calm weather patterns. This is where optimism about climate change can be found. And this is without factoring in all the carbon sequestration from restoring desertified areas or mangroves or other blue carbon projects in our oceans. Well, as a result of climate change, rising seas uh, are already causing island countries to disappear. Kiribati, Maldives, most of which will likely be underwater by the year 2050, setting up mass migrations and loss of islands that had existed for thousands of years. Micronesia, Fiji, Solomon Islands, and many more are just a few examples of what's gonna be lost in our lifetime due to our actions and inactions. Now, why is this important? Well, because the devastating effects of climate change are disproportionate globally. Together, all these island countries combined are only responsible for less than 0.5% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is a grave example of how the choices we make, particularly with food choice right here in the United States, will have a profound impact on some other living being somewhere else in the world. With every bite of an animal product, we're essentially taking out, taking a bite out of the life of these island countries and causing undue pain and suffering to those that live there. But we can change this. That's the beauty in it. We can change it. By 2050, just 27 years from now, 150 million people around the world will be displaced, losing their homes from rising seas and tides, setting up mass migrations inland, and that's a conservative figure. So to summarize the connection between food choice and climate change, we have this. Climate change is very real. It's worsening. The situation is urgent since we've already passed the timeline. Greenhouse gases that we produce, anthropogenic, significantly affect climate change. Raising animals for us to eat is, the, is one of the largest, if not the largest, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore the most important industry to eliminate. And lastly, any food movement away from factory farms, but including grass-fed or pastured, 
uh, pastured animal systems will not solve the problem. In fact, it's going to make it worse. More land use changes, more deforestation, a higher feed conversion ratio we're going to talk about in a minute, and more production of methane. 40 to 70 percent more methane is produced per one grass-fed cow as compared to grain-fed or factory farm cows. Current studies show that on average, we waste 30% of all food produced in the world. So reducing this waste is certainly important in our battle against climate change and loss of natural resources. However, we could reduce our food waste to zero and still be wasting massive amounts of resources and continuing on a path that furthers irreversible climate change if the food we eat has anything to do with animal agriculture. Well, given the predictions of nearly every climate scientist in the world, our business as usual approach to climate change hasn't worked. And time just keeps ticking toward more irreversible damage. We can't s s continue focusing only on gas and oil. Therefore, it's time to get outside the box. It's time to take the right action and do it now. So a final summarizing look at solutions, prescriptions, this is what we have. Continue reducing our dependence on fossil fuels by advancing renewables, great ideas. But it's gonna take a few decades to be fully implemented and we don't have that much time. So we don't have any time actually. So another solution to climate change is that we can stop eating animals. We can do it today. It doesn't have to take any time and we can begin reforestation of all that abused land. That's the prescription to mitigate, not adapt to, but to mitigate climate change. Well, interspersed throughout our discussions are a few themes. One theme is how information about this particular subject, sustainability or climate change has been suppressed and even mismanaged. So much so that objectives of many important meetings uh, like conferences and other organizations, well, the, the objectives aren't being met. And that all begins with the words we use. How clear are they? Are they conveying reality? Well, these are all food movements that superficially seem to make sense. Yeah, they make you feel as if you're, you're going in the right direction because they're going away from factory farms. They're going away from processed foods and that's gotta be a good thing, right? Maybe, maybe not. Do any of these words that you see on the screen mean sustainable or healthy? Many would want you to think so. How about the word humane? Does humane equal sustainable or healthy for all involved? And if it does, which it doesn't, uh, who is it that tries to define humane for all of us? Well, incredibly, there's one person that the USDA and every humane certified organization in the world relies on for that definition of humane, one person. I've covered this strange and unfortunate issue extensively in one of my books. So, so then does humane even equal humane? And what does real food mean? I have issues with its precepts. Uh, real foods is still a very large movement, especially on numerous college campuses today. It's, it's defined as being local, fair, sustainable, and humane, all four of those things. Well, that sounds terrific, but this is terribly misleading again. For instance, um, let me see. Oh, here, I got one right here. So, so, so this is, uh, is, is uh, considered not real food. It's an aloha bar. It's not real food because it's not local, unless, unless you live in Littleton, Colorado, where it's made. And worse, it's processed. It, it, but it does have pumpkin seed and, 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 and other types of organic plant protein, even some organic monk fruit, really put together quite beautifully well. But remember, it's not real food. It doesn't fit their definition. And oh yeah, here's another one. And this uh, pretty ripe or organically grown banana doesn't fit their definition either because it's not local. It was grown in, well, this one was grown in uh, Colombia. So unless you live in Bogota, it's not real food. Whereas these other food items I'm about ready to show you, um, these are considered real food by the real food movement. Yeah, o over 19,000 chickens are killed every minute, every 60 seconds in our country, 19,000. I suppose that's pretty real. And if chicken, beef, pork, fish, or any animal products considered real food, what about, what about these? <laughs> real food too? Yeah, sure, why not? You know, I often mention these come along with it and they're free. So unlike the Aloha bar, these poor souls are considered real food because they're local and the real food people think they're sustainable, healthy, and humane, but they're not. They're none of those things other than being perhaps local. Therefore, the real food movement is flawed because the definitions they're using are flawed, similar to every other food movement on this list. Just because something's local doesn't at all mean that it's healthy or sustainable or humane. It doesn't even mean that it should be eaten. The only thing that local means is that it's not very far from here. Now buying local has little to do with sustainability other than from an economic standpoint. It's a very solid idea to help nearby farmers, that's important. But in fact, transportation 
is only responsible for 4%, just 4% of all the fossil fuels used and all the greenhouse gases emitted in the entire food production process. So it's much more relevant to view all this by using a complete life cycle analysis. Well, in 2019, the United Nations designated the next 10 years as a decade of family farming, which is a good thing for the 500 million small family farmers in the world, most of which have limited opportunities to improving their livelihood, and yet they produce over 80% of the world's food. But in terms of our health and the health of our environment, we must remember that it is that it is the type of food that is being produced that matters most, not the size of the farm or the miles traveled. So by all means, support your local farmer markets, any one of the 8,700 throughout the United States today, and support your local cooperatives. But it has to be plant-based in order to make good sense for our planet. And here's a new animal agricultural movement uh, just in the last couple of years that's gaining momentum called climate smart. Now, it's a nice thought, but given the global warming predicament we're in, shouldn't we be growing and eating only plant-based foods? which would then make this food movement the climate smartest. Uh, I mean, we, we, we all wanna be smart, but who wouldn't wanna be the smartest? <laughs> the most recent food movement in the United States and Canada and Europe that's gaining considerable traction is this one, to eat less meat, or now it's being called uh, eat a plant forward diet, but it's the same goal of eating less meat. So let's see the logic in this food movement is if you recognize you're doing something that's wrong, hurtful, and frankly, unnecessary, hey, just continue doing that wrong, hurtful, unnecessary thing a few less times each day. Yeah, that kind of makes sense somewhere. So despite what the United Nations and other gold standard organizations are promoting, this sustainability issue will not be solved by advocating eating less meat because that approach is subjective. It's inconsistent with the magnitude and the urgency of the problem, and it perpetuates irresponsibility with every bite taken also it mistakenly shifts the focus to seafood, which as we all know, isn't supposed to be real, really meat, is it, right? <laughs> Again, it all begins with the words we use. Are they conveying reality? The words food, meat, consumption, slaughter, protein should, should, be, should not be words that we associate with animals. I mean, after all, we're, we're animals. So when we talk about this word protein and of course slaughtering, we, we talk about these issues frequently at our sanctuary in, uh, in Michigan. Uh, here my faithful research assistants, one in the chair, one below me there, uh, are looking over my notes. They're reminding me to put a good word in about turkeys, which I try to do. And we often talk about words and definitions in our, in our daily walks. <laughs> I'm not sure which of these two little buddies wanna be called protein. I don't think either one of them wanna be called protein. <laughs> Barney here is having a heart to heart discussion about that topic with us uh, right now about this terminology problem. He doesn't want to be called protein. And here are a few, a few others uh, just talking about the problem here, uh, voicing their opinion. And Solomon here is making real sure that I let everyone know just uh, what, what's that you say, Solomon? He wants everyone to know how kind yeah, how kind pigs are, how, okay, I got it, how smart pigs are, and yeah, okay, how clean pigs are. Okay, so uh, I put a good word in for you there. And talking about words and definitions, Plato still wonders why we humans choose to call him protein or beef instead of, say, for instance, just calling him Plato. He's, uh, that's his name, and he's, he's confused. And when talking about food choice, we often are over-focused on the life and death of farmed animals, aren't we? But we need to include all wild animals as well, as, as well, large and small, even insects. Because wild animals are the ones who are rapidly losing habitat. They're being displaced or exterminated because of our food choices. These are just some of the many who have voiced their, their concern to me over the years about this problem. Her last words, I think she whispered to me, were, what about me? I need help too. It's not just about cows, you know. Well, one of the most pressing concerns we have today regarding sustaining our life and future life on Earth is our supply of fresh water. From 1941 to 2011, the world's population tripled, but freshwater consumption quadrupled. In 2016, the World Economic Forum ranked freshwater crisis as the top global risk to industry and society over the next decade that we're still in. It wasn't climate change, which was number two on their list. It was freshwater crisis, lack of availability, 
failure to properly address climate change has now moved up to their number one concern this year. But that's not because freshwater crisis has improved. In fact, it hasn't. It's, it's gotten worse. There's a growing gap between worldwide demand for water and what's really available. So much demand, there's expected to be a 40% shortage in water supply in just the next eight years. And what you decide to eat has every single thing to do with this. Scientists are very concerned about water scarcity, but I think it's really more about water management, isn't it? We're gonna look at this pretty carefully because instead of focusing on technologies, we should be first looking at choices. Is this a good choice? How about this choice? Are any of these good choices? These are conservative figures by a rep very reputable uh, organization. They're all global averages. Are these good choices as compared to say these choices? It's quite a difference when you say, uh, it, look at it, it requires 400 gallons of water just to slaughter one cow or one pig in the United States, 400 gallons. Although water on earth remains constant, the consumptive form it happens to be in does not. Four out of five people now live within 30 miles of a water damaged area, meaning soon to run out or polluted. More than 4 billion people experience severe water scarcity at least one month per year. There are nearly 300 transboundary river and waterways on earth where multiple countries share vital running water supply. As we see water shortages over the next eight years, we're gonna surely see droughts, famine, human sickness, and then we're gonna see conflicts, social unrest, and even wars. Indeed, those living downstream will be fiercely battling those living upstream for their water rights. Climate change is gonna make these matters worse, but not cause them. Food choice and virtual water trading through food, especially with animal products, will play a much larger role than energy or fossil fuel use. In many areas of the world, freshwater scarcity coexists with hunger and poverty. Afghanistan, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia are raising livestock and crops to feed them while running their water supplies dry. 60% of Ethiopia's population suffers from hunger and thirst, and yet their dehydrated land is being used to support a growing herd of over 65 million cattle, the largest in Africa. And despite having an organization that has accomplished so many wonderful things in the world, Bill and Melinda Gates and their foundation should be frankly embarrassed about funding the proliferation, I just circled it there on the slide, funding the proliferation of animal agriculture anywhere in the world, let alone here in dehydrated Ethiopia. And so it is for Mongolia. India, China, Portugal, uh, nearly every country in the world, so, struggling with an increasing human population, the effects of climate change and dwindling resources and then being strangled by their meat and dairy culture. They just don't wanna change. So that has to include the country of California, right? <laughs> so, and, and most of the Southwest United States. In the past 22 years, this mega drought in the Southwest United States has become so severe that it's now the driest two decades in the region in at least the last 1,200 years. So shouldn't we be using our water more efficiently? Regarding this freshwater topic, uh, things aren't going so well there in California, but I've, have they given thought or you, have you given a thought to where most of the wa dwindling water supply is going? It's not to golf courses and most of it's not to lawn care. Between 60 and 70% of the total consumptive water usage in California goes to livestock and crops to feed them. So, you know, being concerned and mandating restrictions that include not watering lawns for two days after it rains or not using drinking water to clean sidewalks or to wash cars and with $500 per day fines for not complying, well, that won't solve California's problems. And Governor Newsom mandated a 15% cut in water use this past year, but that won't solve much either because California has not factored in the water footprint of what they're eating. Let's look at that. As an example, California uses... 960,000 acres of land just to produce alfalfa. Anyone out there uh, that's viewing this from California? I'm sure a few are. What do you, why do you do that? Because e each one of those 960,000 acres of alfalfa requires 2 million gallons of water per year to irrigate. And they all get irrigated, every one of those. And guess where all that alfalfa goes? It goes to livestock, 5% to horses, the rest to livestock. 75% goes to dairy cows and there are 2.5 million dairy cows just in California alone. Using less water to brush our teeth, flush 
toilets, do laundry, or less time in the shower, will save two gallons of water per day for each act. Well, that's important. However, eliminating meat and dairy from one's diet will save on average over 2,600 gallons of water per person every day. If California stopped growing alfalfa for livestock just for one year, just stop growing alfalfa for one year, stop irrigating it, the amount of water saved that one year would be enough to provide drinking water to the entire human population of the city of San Francisco. Not for one year, but every year for the next 12,500 years. This is hard to believe. It's so hard to believe that here, here's the math. Math doesn't lie. Let's go ahead and take a picture of that. And it's spelled out pretty well. Nor does where all the water is going in California. That doesn't lie either. The average household in the United States uses 76,000 gallons of water in one year, according to the EPA, indoor use, about 33,000 outdoors. It's quite a bit of water, and it's what we're focused on in times of drought, how to reduce this. The average person in the United States consumes 274 pounds of meat, though, in one year, divided between 85 pounds of cow, 66 pounds of pig, 123 pounds of chicken and turkey, in addition to the 288 eggs and 655 pounds of dairy products. <laughs> which equates to 956,000 gallons of water per person per year, just to support that animal product diet. So now a more accurate view that the EPA should be broadcasting and everyone should know about is that every household of three people in the United States, well, they use nearly 3 million gallons of water each year, not 76,000. The real amount is nearly 3 million gallons. And 96% of that outrageous water use is from their choice to eat animals. So whenever there's a drought or water shortage anywhere in the United States, which there is, and there will continue to be, does the government or your community ever step up and declare a state of rationing or eliminating meat or dairy? Well, why not? What? Why shouldn't they? In 2015, the largest desalination plant in North America opened near San Diego. It costs $1 billion and provides drinking water for about 10% of the human population there. There's a two to one ratio of, of seawater going into drinking water coming out that's needed in the process. And the energy required to produce water in this manner each day is enough to support the needs of about 30,000 homes. Well, this approach, is, this approach to freshwater scarcity is very similar to those I've seen in Israel, Saudi Arabia, uh, Dubai, and other arid coastal countries of the world, now totaling more than 21,000 desalination plants. But the answer to our running out of a natural resource such as water, I don't think should begin by turning to another source of water and then causing other environmental issues and tapping out that as well. It seems the right way to approach our natural resources is to use them in the most efficient manner possible. So instead of desalination, maybe San Diego should have considered spending $1 billion on educating their citizens on the environmental benefits of eliminating meat, dairy, and fish from their diets, among all the other benefits. And then they would have liberated between 50 and 90% more water each day, rather than their meager 10% gained by way of sucking water out of our oceans. Recent satellite studies called GRACE, the acronym for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, has shown that 40% of the largest aquifers on Earth are being overdrawn unsustainably and becoming rapidly and irreversibly depleted. California's Central Valley Aquifer System and the southern portion of Ogallala in the and the high plain states are two of the at most risk ancient aquifers in the world of being completely depleted in the next few, few decades. And most of the ancient water used in all these regions uh, is going to livestock or crops to feed them. As an example, among other locations in the world, 6,000 water wells have already dried up in California over the past seven years. Over 50% of those dried up wells happen to be in one county, Tulare County. These wells didn't dry up because of climate change. No, Tulare County, County happens to be the, the leading county in the United States for dairy production. That's where all the water went to produce cow's milk at a ratio of about a thousand gallons of water to produce just one gallon of milk. For a clarified visual here that you see on the screen is a map of the wells drying up in the state of California. And I've circled on the right, Tulare County. Notice where all the, where all the dried up wells are located. And now here are the hot businesses in that county. Notice anything related to wasted water use there? Uh, let me see stockyards and more stockyards and numerous cattle companies and livestock markets and more livestock markets. That might have something to do with it. 
you know, I've talked about this water use disconnect 10 years ago, uh, basically everywhere in the world, but especially to policymakers and the public in California and elsewhere, but no one seems to be really listening or acting. It's a bit frustrating. Of course, the threat is getting worse and it's spreading. Again, knowing and doing. In terms of raw numbers, livestock consume 34 trillion gallons of fresh water each year in the United States alone. 34 trillion gallons by way of drinking water and water to grow crops to feed them. So the question remains, even though we experience periods of less precipitation, is it the drought that we should be most concerned about in California and across the Southwest United States and the Middle East and elsewhere in the world? Or is it more of a problem of misuse of the freshwater supplies and resources that happen to be available at any particular point in time. How we use them, how we, how we best manage it. Maybe this is the way we should begin viewing this issue. So then these are the timelines for fresh water and it's not anything we should feel comfortable with. But what about this phrase? How often do you hear this, this phrase? Millions of people proclaim their love of fish every day of the year and yet we eat them. In fact, for 98% of all individuals in the world, this phrase, I love fish, actually means this. I love to eat fish, doesn't it? Because if you love fish, as in loving your cat or, or Bailey, your dog, <laughs> uh, you certainly wouldn't kill and eat them, right? I mean, we have things backwards. I don't think so. Again, it's how we use our words, isn't it? You know, there are three principal ways our oceans are being destroyed, and all of them are caused or at least heavily affected by food choice. Raising and eating animals on land causes warming and acidification of our oceans, which is now thought to be irreversible in our lifetime. Surface runoff from livestock operations on land has caused more than 550 nitrogen flooded dead zones around the world, comprising 95,000 square miles of areas completely devoid of oxygen or life. So any meaningful discussion of the state of our oceans has to first begin with frank discussions about land-based animal agriculture, but, but it is fishing that has the largest impact of all. Incredibly large amounts of sea life are taken from our oceans in three ways. First, they're taken as target fish. You know, th that's the one you wanna eat. Uh, but fish are also taken out of our oceans to feed other fish grown on factory fish farms, part of the aquaculture movement. And lastly, fish are also taken as bykill due to the first two types of fishing. Well, that doesn't really leave too much in our oceans now, does it? In fact, our oceans are being ravaged and yet everyone we know still eats fish. Fragile, interdependent and poorly understood ecosystems have been devastated. Over 93 million tons of fish were caught just last year with quite a few more millions of tons of bykill, which are all those other innocent sea life caught, killed and discarded in the process of trying to catch that targeted fish everyone's asking for. Bykill includes juvenile fish. So they'll never see their way to maturity. All seven of the endangered sea turtles are being caught as bykill. Sea lions, birds, dolphins, even, even whales are, are bykill. Of the 17 major fishing stock areas in the world, all are either overexploited or on the verge of collapse. 89% of the world's fish species are affected, considered heavily depleted or overfoot, overfished from, from fishing practices. Well, that's quite a bit of damage, but along comes this word sustainable to somehow seemingly justify continued harvesting. So how's this word even used in the fishing industry? Who defines it? Who, who monitors it? And with less than 3%, less than 3% of all of our oceans being regulated, who decides on enforcement? If you look at this carefully or even not so carefully, the, the real answer is no one. And I say real answer because now there's sea life caught and labeled sustainable when in fact it's not. But it's still labeled as such by a number of highly respected organizations, such as the Marine Stewardship Council or MSC. You know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, after 10 years of knowing of this of problems that I'm about to talk about, they still have lobster from the Gulf of Maine and Canada listed as a good alternative. It's not a good alternative for many reasons. Rapidly declining number of lobster, inefficient trapping mechanisms, and most importantly to me is the very sad effect lobster trapping has on the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. When I talked about this a couple of years ago, there are 450 of these left. Now there are only 340 of these truly magnificent creatures left that we haven't killed. And nearly all of them, 83% of them are getting entangled, injured and killed in those, in those darn trap lines. But it's not just 
lobster trap line from Maine that caused all the problems behind the scenes. It's fishing nets from all over the world. Whales caught in fishing nets die a very slow, painful, agonizing death while trying to desperately free themselves over a period of six months time on average from the time they first became entangled. Six months. We owe these whales and lobster much more than this or this. Elsewhere in the world, there have been an estimated 800,000 tons of non-biodegradable fishing nets cut loose from fishing vessels each year for the past 25 years, catching countless numbers of unsuspecting sea life. An estimated 30% of all fishing nets and lines used globally are lost each year, 30% in our oceans. The indiscriminate use and discarding of plastics is certainly a problem uh, everywhere on earth, isn't, isn't it? But but nowhere is it more devastating to other life forms than in our oceans. Nearly 600 million pounds of plastic are now floating around in our oceans, making it a massive pool of our waste. The largest of five plastic garbage zones in our oceans, um, called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, covers 620,000 square miles in an area of the North Pacific between California and Hawaii. It's three times the size of France. And while we should indeed be concerned about plastic straws and plastic bottles and bags, we should also be concerned about fishing because 46% of all that plastic found in this floating garbage country, 46% of all that plastic is from ghost nets from fishing operations. Only 1% is from plastic straws. When researchers in ocean conservation groups discuss the topic of overfishing, they typically point to the tons of wild fish caught per year and those raised in aquaculture, and they call this production. Well, I look at it much differently, certainly more accurately, by adding to these figures another 28 million tons of IUU, which is illegally caught and unregulated and unreported uh, fish, which I don't even know how they come up with those numbers, vastly on the conservative side, I'm sure, and, they, and also bykill, which amounts to perhaps another 200 million tons of sea animals per year. So it's not accurate at all for researchers to call any of this production because in reality, what we're doing is destroying. Fishing, of course, destroys species of target fish, but it also destroys ecosystems and biodiversity. All forms of fishing are destructive by definition because all forms of fishing kill something. Fishing, again, also destroys habitat. So how effective is that sustainable seafood label? There are many, many examples of oceanic species that have collapsed while under the watch of those two certified sustainable organizations since they were formed in the mid to late 1990s. Uh, everything on this list that you see is considered and labeled sustainable, but none of them really are. Cod were fished to only 1% of their original numbers off the coast of Newfoundland, more recently to a near extinct status in the North Sea while stated they were sustainable. They'll never recover in our lifetime. Well, I've run out of room on this one slide to show you all the species in trouble. So, so here's a number for you. Over 1,000 types of fish are affected. And so it is with fishing under that sustainable label. Target fish are becoming extinct. We move on to the next fish in line, creating cereal depletion. And then other, other sea life up and down the, the food web are becoming extinct. A cascade effect, all part of the collateral damage that begins with us. Well, coral reef systems around the world are in serious trouble. Most of us know this. The Great Barrier Reef has lost more than half of its coral cover since 1985. Most would think it's due to pollution and climate change, which are factors. But the primary initial cause of coral reef death there and throughout most of the world is not pollution. And it's not from climate change, it's from overfishing. An example in the other direction can be found in the Queens Islands off the southern coast of Cuba, where they haven't allowed any commercial fishing and the coral reef ecosystems there look the same as they have for the past several thousands of years. Are coral reefs in serious danger from the effects of climate change? Sure, they're the, um, among the most vulnerable of any ecosystem on earth, but studies have shown, many studies have shown now that maintaining coral reefs as a no-take marine protected area, meaning no fishing allowed and strictly enforced, well, it'll, it'll make coral reefs six times more resilient to the effects of global warming and climate change, six times. One of the most important factors in balancing coral reef systems are predatory fish like sharks, but we're killing them too. Quite a few of them, one third of all shark species are nearing extinction. We're killing well over 100 to 150 million sharks 
per year. Why? Well, 70 to 100 million sharks have their fins cut off like this, and then they're thrown overboard to die so we can eat shark fin soup. Yeah, it's still going on. It's terrible to see this, isn't it? And I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourselves, I don't eat shark fin soup, not me. And furthermore, it's banned in 14 states in the United States. Isn't that something? But again, over 98% of us worldwide do eat fish. And by eating fish, any type of fish, we're doing this to 60 million sharks that are caught each year and killed in fishing nets and fishing lines as bycal. So go ahead and ban shark fin soup all you want. But why would you stop there? If you're truly concerned about endangered sea turtles, whales, sharks, dolphins, and the state of our oceans, if you're truly concerned, you should ban fishing. Many fisheries that are accepted and labeled as sustainable are actually viewed by many scientists as unsustainable as I'm talking about. Killing krill now has become a pretty large business, but you don't need to eat krill or any other sea life to get your omega-3s, um, unless you listen to Dr. Oz, uh, which you probably shouldn't do. However, krill is fundamental to the survival of almost every animal species in and around the Antarctic. Once the most abundant animal species on earth, krill numbers have dropped by 80% since 1978, in turn affecting the decline of a number of penguin species and making it difficult for baleen whales, such as blue, right, and fin, who are desperately trying to make a comeback. Yet scientists admit to knowing very little about krill or the interconnected ecosystems heavily affected by krill, such as phytoplankton and algae at one direction and all the other species that feed on krill in the other direction. We're just learning now, for instance, about krill's importance in capturing carbon from the atmosphere, removing up to 12 gigatons per year in greenhouse gas emissions. Just another of the many examples of humans interference of nature's complex web of balancing itself. Again, we don't need to eat krill, but other species do. It's pretty simple. The numbers of most species of fish have declined by over 90% of their original numbers. Bluefin tuna and swordfish species are less than 4% of their historic numbers, still not protected by the Endangered Species Act because, well, because we would rather eat them into extinction. Instead of eating dolphin free tuna, we should be concerned about simply eating tuna free. This is an approved, this is a, an approved method of sustainable, of sustainably catching tuna. The most heavily killed fish in the world are anchovies at 10 million tons per year in 2020. The most heavily killed larger fish species in the world is the Alaskan pollock, harvested at a rate of 4 million tons per year. Both are still labeled as sustainable. I mean, who would think you could take 10 million tons of any species from anywhere on earth and think somehow they wouldn't be missed? Right? Uh, unbelievable. This, this is a humpback whale trying to find some sardines somewhere to feed on. Now, here's the point regarding our oceans. It's, it's no longer a problem of overfishing. That was a term that could be applied uh, back in the early 1800s. Today, it's simply about fishing. Well, not to worry because now we have fish farms, over 50% of all the fish consumed world, worldwide are produced from aquaculture, which is growing faster than any other food sector. One reason for this tremendous growth is the very false illusion of environmentalism. 60% of all fish farms are land-based, some are indoors, some are outside like this one, where he's proudly showing me the protein they produce. And funny, it looks like a fish to me that they're, they're producing. And regardless of where the fish on your plate comes from now or in the future, is the process of catching and slaughtering fish. Is that process humane? And if it's not humane, then why do we do it? So I'm wondering if anybody knows what nociceptors are, especially polymodal nociceptors. They're, they're sensory receptors associated with feeling pain. All of, all of you have them. Uh, most mammals have numerous polymodal nociceptors in and around their face or in and around their head and their neck. Well, so do fish. They, they can feel this. In reality, there's no such thing then as sustainable commercial fishing. Especially if you apply the three factors of how that word sustainable is even defined by the industry itself. There it is on the screen. It's impossible. Not even improbable, it's impossible. Well, please note the sobering statistic at the bottom of this slide, over 200 
million sea animals are extracted from our oceans every hour. So why can't we give our oceans a break? What's inhibiting us from providing rest, complete rest for our oceans, which is what they need and what's been shown to work historically in various settings around the world? Well, is it, is it because of economics? Yeah, sure it is. Global subsidies for the fishing industry are now $35 billion per year, which then supports the continued devastation of our oceans. Global revenues from fishing are at about $150 billion, billion US dollars per year, but only $7 billion of that comes from deep sea fishing. Well, it's been found that fish sequester greenhouse gases. Imagine that. Not counting all the sea life found in our reef systems, recent studies have found that deep sea fish sequester up to two gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. Well, that equates to about $222 billion worth of savings and costs in our technological efforts to battle global warming. So there's a clear argument for, isn't there, for banning fishing on the high seas strictly from an economic standpoint. Fish are more valuable if left alone in our oceans as live climate change mitigating agents than as food on our plates. $222 billion versus $7 billion. Seems simple to me. With continued extraction, warming, and acidification and deoxygenation, our oceans that we once felt were so robust will very soon be unable to support what few life forms remain in and around them. So the timelines for our oceans look like this. This is not science fiction. It's not something I made up just on the way over here. It's reality. And quite sadly, it's all happened on our watch. You're looking at what we've created and now passing on to future generations. It's very true. When our oceans die, we die. While palm oil has front page notoriety, tropical rainforest loss due to livestock has occurred at a four times greater rate than that due to palm oil. In the last 25 years, 10 times more rainforest has been lost due to raising livestock than has been lost due to palm oil. So be concerned about palm oil, certainly, but then be 10 times more concerned about livestock and animal agriculture. Tropical rainforests cover 5 million square miles, housing more than half the world's 10 million species of plants, animals, and insects, and many more millions that are undiscovered. The Amazon rainforest alone produces more than 20% of the world's supply of oxygen. Satellite analysis showed that 30 million acres of tropical rainforest, 30 million acres were destroyed last year alone. 34% of Earth's tropical rainforests have already been cleared and 30% have been degraded. Unfortunately for those living in our rainforest, this is what a few thousand to a million year old rainforest now looks like because uh, the, of the world's food priorities. There, it's with eating livestock, not with being stewards of other living beings as we should be. With deforestation, this is the sad result, the burning and bulldozing of rainforest. Soon grass, pasture, and cattle will follow this in. So if you choose to eat livestock here in the United States or anywhere else in the world, you're supporting this destruction by fueling the global demand for meat. Between 70 and 80% of all rainforest loss in the Amazon is due to raising cattle with another 10% loss due to growing crops to feed them. And remember, these livestock are grazing. It's not a matter of factory farming. And regardless of the effects of climate change, by the year 2050, made less resilient, but not caused by climate change, most tropical rainforests will be gone. And the few patches that remain will have already been way past their tipping point. This of course means that all the millions of species that originally lived in these rainforests will be gone. The indigenous tribes and shaman will be lost forever. The, the, the once abundant water systems destroyed, and of course their oxygenation and climate regulatory mechanisms will be lost for the next few thousands to millions of years, which is how long it took these rainforests to develop their current state of evolution. And we've wiped them out in less than 50 years. Well, some scientists and United Nation policy makers predict that we have only 60 years left before we run out of topsoil because one third to one half of all Earth's topsoil has already been lost just in the past 150 years. Most of the world's agricultural land suffers from severe erosion. Well, we need topsoil to grow food. At the beginning of this erosion and desertification equation is deforestation. And the majority of deforestation can be blamed squarely on animal agriculture. In fact, less than 2% of all crops grown worldwide today are with organic methods for direct human consumption, less than 2%. Soil is the Earth's fragile skin that supports all life on Earth. 
Within soil, you'll find countless species that create a complex ecosystem. Well, animal agriculture is the single largest contributor to soil damage and loss by way of converting forests and natural grasslands to farm fields and pastures. In addition to erosion, soil quality is affected by other aspects of, of uh, animal agriculture, including many negative effects by way of grazing. Just one small teaspoon of soil, one small teaspoon of soil will contain more living organisms than we have people in the world. Soils at the center of the United Nations sustainability or sustainable development goals because food security, water scarcity, biodiversity loss, and human health threats are closely linked to or dependent upon soil biodiversity. While the International Union of Soil Science declared the years from 2015 to 2024 as the International Decade of Soils, which is a great effort to save one of our most precious resources. Well, this is their informational poster, which cleverly displays at the bottom within the roots of the plant, what they consider to be solutions to this, this grave soil degradation crisis. But nowhere on this poster <laughs> or anywhere else in their documents or website can be found uh, or mentioned about the number one cause of soil erosion and degradation, which is animal agriculture. So, so why wouldn't their number one solution found in the roots somewhere there be to stop eating animals? This is just, again, this huge disconnect. Well, this is how much land is being used to raise livestock. 40% of the entire ice-free terrestrial land mass on earth. If we factor in the 230 million acres of public lands used for grazing, livestock account for 90% of all the land used for agriculture in the United States. The reason animal agriculture creates so many sustainability problems is quite, quite simple. It's terribly inefficient. It wastes resources, energy, and lives. You can produce 15 times more protein if that's what you're concerned about uh, from plants as you can from animals on any given area of land. Meat and dairy products require up to 100 times more water than plant-based foods, a fraction of the fossil fuel use. And plants, again, remember, sequester or draw down greenhouse gases rather than causing them. Well, this statistic needed to be updated, so I, I updated it. Livestock now produce 11 million pounds of urine and feces every 60 seconds in our country. 11 million pounds, which is 100 times more than the entire human population produces. 950 million people are suffering from hunger worldwide with a child dying from hunger every 10 seconds. To be sure, world hunger has many layers of complexity. One of the larger reasons is tied to poverty. But another significant factor is the looming shadow of our current demand to eat livestock and fish, which is indirectly tied to poverty. In fact, eating these animals ultimately affects food prices, food availability, and policymaking, which then suppresses progress in developing countries. Last year, there was considered a record harvest grain in the world again, with over 3 billion tons produced, but nearly half of that was given to animals in the meat and dairy industries. Each year, 77% of all coarse grain produced in the world for food, 77% is consumed by livestock. So we can't blame climate change droughts or flooding for the world's food security issues, although they will be modifying factors. Clearly the difficulty is not how or if we can produce enough food to feed the hungry or the growing global population, but rather where all the food we currently produce globally is going. Well, solving world hunger is not as simple as just giving them the grain that would normally go to livestock. It's not that easy. So the solution, particularly in developing countries that I've written about over the years, requires a multi-dimensional approach to sustainability establishing it on many levels simultaneously with organic plant-based food systems at the nucleus. So the model for success at reducing hunger in developing countries, I believe should look like this, no livestock. And this is the model where all world hunger financing should be spent if it's to be considered responsible financing. Well, we're losing other species on earth at an unprecedented rate plants, animals, insects, the current view of most scientists is more related to the rate of extinction rather than the exact number because, well, they simply can't keep up with all the extinctions. It's sad that we're losing anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 times the background rate, that which has been seen for the previous 10 million years, which used to be about two to four species documented going extinct per year. Regardless of the metric, it's now a massive and embarrassing amount and 10,000 10, times that much. So why all the extinctions and what are we doing about it? Realizing that there's a serious 
problem and part of the Convention on Biological Diversity held in 2010, 200 nations adopted a 10-year plan to save other species by the year 2020. These are just four of those 20 targets that were agreed upon. But unfortunately, none of those targets were met, not one of them. And worse, loss of biodiversity is actually accelerating. <laughs> by the way, uh, these are the uh, recognized five drivers of biodiversity loss that you see on the right side of the screen, lower right. Nearly all researchers agree that climate change is not the first or the second most significant driver of biodiversity loss. They all agree that the leading cause of all five of these drivers combined is animal agriculture, livestock on land and fishing in our oceans. So it's pretty easy to meet their goal of reducing fishing, for instance, or reducing overfishing, just stop eating fish. Done, problem solved. I also know where they could get 40% more land to save. With failure of their targets set in 2010, at their meeting in Nagoya, and again, failure in 2020 in Aichi. Last year, the Convention on Biological Diversity announced a new set of goals. Here they are. Once again, there's no direct mention of a plan to eliminate the major driver of biodiversity loss through all influencing factors, which is the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. No mention of that at all. So their 21 targets were very, will very predictably not be met again. Once again, climate change plays the role of an exacerbator. It doesn't cause this. It's just going to worsen this situation. The Living Planet Index shows that we lost more than half of all vertebrate animal species in the world since 1970. Half are gone. It's no surprise that during that same 50-year period of time, global production of meat and dairy products quadrupled. A landmark study was published in 2019, just a couple of years ago, the most comprehensive ever, regarding the state of our ecosystems. And among other things, they predicted that 1 million plant and animal species are predicted to be at risk of extinction just within the next few decades, 1 million. Essentially 30 to 50% of all living species on earth will be extinct or heading toward extinction by the year 2050. It's quite stark. Well, what we're doing to other forms of life on earth is unparalleled in the history of our planet where one species is causing the mass extinction of nearly all other species. So it reminds me of this somewhat well-known and very appropriate comment that I pull out every once in a while. If all insects on earth disappeared, within 50 years, all life on earth would end. However, if all human beings disappeared from earth, within 50 years, all forms of life would, would flourish. So how do we solve all this, all these issues of global depletion, knowing and doing? Over the years, I've been proposing two categories of, of solutions. First, there needs to be widespread sweeping education of the public and those with a platform of influence. We need to educate the educated and reach a higher level of consciousness. And second, we need to implement initiatives based on that education, such as creating policies which open the door for businesses and help new and also young farmers and help transition existing farms from animal agriculture to plant-based systems and to transition those in the fishing industry, for instance, to plant-based businesses beginning with the reallocation of $770 billion per year, we spend globally subsidizing the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. Just use some of that money. This money could be spent more wisely and effectively for education and transitioning purposes. Here are the land-based jobs that I think could be easily created. I'm not gonna go over all these, so we can, take, we can come back to this hopefully at any point in time, but these are the land-based jobs I think could be easily created and how they could be funded easy solutions. And these are the ocean blue carbon and waterway jobs I think could be easily created. In all, nearly 200 million new and transition jobs could be easily created globally that could potentially add another $3.6 trillion in revenue just by the year 2030. This helps answer the question, but what do we do, Dr. Oakland, with the, like the 39 million fisher people in the world if we ban fishing? Well, there's your answer. And likewise, for all those involved with land, with livestock on land. Well, this question, along with aquaculture, is one of the questions of our future. I think it's a great example I'd like to pull out. It's a topic that's gaining momentum, which I find a natural path. We're going to talk more about this in a minute, but I'm going to tell you an example right now of people wanting just so badly to hang on to the false sense of needing versus simply wanting to eat animal products. It's a path of least resistance. And let's look at a couple of different ways to answer this. I mean, there, there's one way. I mean, he thinks so, and so do many others. My thought, though, is that we need to be fully aware 
of the consequences of our food cho choices, not partially aware. And we need to understand what we're doing to all aspects of global depletion. We need to know the urgency of the problem. This isn't a go meatless on Monday or when we get around to it type of problem. So another way to answer that question, this grass fed question is if we gave each one of you an acre of land to grow your own food, what would you grow? What, what should you grow? And I always point out that that all my college and university lectures, the students know what they want to grow. Yeah, they don't really talk about anything else. They <laughs> grow this. They also ask me if they can grow this, but it's becoming a solid choice. But regarding food on this one acre, you could try to raise one grass fed cow thinking it's fully sustainable. Just like, just like that New York Times multiple time bestselling authors telling everyone. But in most areas of the world, one acre is not enough. You're going to need five, 10, 20. I've seen even up to 50 acres needed for one cow. So if you use your one acre for grass-fed livestock, you'd end up with about 50 to 100 pounds of a type of product that some call food that's then implicated in the number of disease states after you eat it. And along the way, you produce six to seven tons of methane and carbon dioxide, and you've used two million gallons of water for that one cow while displacing biodiversity. Or instead, if you use your acre of land to grow vegetable fruit combination, grain combination, you produce 20 to 60,000 pounds of food that's infinitely healthier for you to eat and for our planet to grow. When looking at global growing applications, I mean, how cool is this? Certain plants like kale will actually continue to grow through extremes of temperature from five, minus five degrees here in my backyard in Michigan through 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And after you pick the leaves to eat, does anyone know what happens to kale? New ones grow back. They regenerate. I bet your cow can't do that. It's astounding what you can produce on that one acre over the period of time, usually a couple years, even two and a half years, it would take to raise your grass fed cow. There you go. It's quite an amazing difference. And now imagine extrapolating that model out in terms of global use of our resources and now answer that question about how sustainable raising grass fed livestock really is. That, that's what I always ask uh, before I get escorted off the farm hastily. <laughs> And for those who think that eating any animal product is sustainable, then it's time to introduce this concept. Optimal relative sustainability. That'll work. How sustainable is it to raise and eat any animal product in a relative sense as compared to plant-based foods? How can we best use our resources? What foods will have the very least effect on, on climate change? Which foods best promote our own human health and which are the most compassionate? All wrapped up in one package. This is the way we need to start viewing things in a relative sense as to then how to achieve optimal sustainability. Well, in the future, we're gonna be hearing more and more about these topics. You're probably hearing about them right now, today. All part of the better meat movement, which simply impedes our evolution toward plant-based systems. That's all it's doing, it's slowing us down to get on the right track. Instead of simply switching to plant-based foods, these three categories seem to be what our global society believes to be the solution to our environmental woes. Just do those three things, but it's not working. What does better meat mean? Well, I found that this concept of better meat falls into two categories. The first is grass-fed, pastured, humane raised, supposedly beef, chicken, pork, turkey, or fish from aquaculture settings. And the second category is meat raised in a, or created in a laboratory, which is growing very fast. Looking at the first category, all grass-fed, pastured animals are in many ways more unsustainable than factory farm animals. So that's not better, is it? We'll go over some numbers here in a moment. Grass-fed meat is still unhealthy for human consumption as compared to plant-based foods. And grass-fed meat is produced from, anim from animals that are still slaughtered, which by any stretch of the imagination is not humane. So well, the only people who think this is better meat are those who are blinded by producing it or eating it. And now regarding the second category, which is meat produced from animal stem cells in the laboratory, Bill Gates has invested heavily in this just recently. It's also called cultured meat. Once at $330,000 per single patty just 10 years ago, now it's at about $10 per burger patty. And instead of only beef as an offering, over 70 company, companies worldwide are now developing other types of laboratory meats, such as chicken, duck, pig, lamb, even kangaroo and horse meat. I had the opportunity to speak with the CEOs of the two leading companies in this laboratory meat market. And there are a couple of things that are very clear. Although meat produced in the lab has some, but certainly not all of the humane aspects worked out. For instance, they still use fetal bovine serum for the medium, that's blood from a dead calf. Um, and from an environmental standpoint, we don't have 10 to 30 years for this to be brought up to scale. Just one facility with bioreactors 
will cost $450 million and would only be able to produce less than 1 50th of 1% as much meat that's currently being consumed by the United States population. So from a human health standpoint also, laboratory meat's sketchy at best. For example, both companies couldn't answer my questions about human health because their laboratory meat as of now will still have many of the components that degrade our own human health, such as cholesterol, saturated fat. They can manipulate that a little bit in the laboratory, lack of fiber, phytonutrients, anti-angiogenic substances, no cancer inhibiting capabilities, et cetera. And laboratory meat will still have all the inflammatory stressors that come along with all the meat that we're, we're eating now. Increased levels of C-reactive protein, everything that you see on this list, their arachidonic acid. Um, and another thing is, is that there's one potential health concern that stands out to me too, is the cancer potential, uh, cancer promoting properties of cells that proliferate exponentially in the laboratory. So it's certainly plausible that consuming laboratory grown meat uh, will have certainly faulty cell lines and they may have unwarranted effects on the human body. Anyway, there's really no argument then about these two types. And lastly, this is what Josh Tetrick recently said in a summary of the laboratory meat industry's objectives. Well, he's the CEO of Eat Just who just, who raised over $1 billion for his company to ramp up laboratory meat production globally. He says this, it's real meat, says Tetrick. And instead of needing billions of animals and all the land and all the water and all the rainforest you typically need to knock down to make that happen, we start with a cell. Now we don't need the animal anymore. So Josh Tetrick said, well, since our Neanderthal days, we actually never needed animals to eat. Not, not sure where Josh has been all these years. And, and, keep, and keep in mind that his laboratory meat approach has minimally 10 times the carbon footprint of plant-based meat alternatives and, and will not have any of the sequestration of greenhouse gases that plant-based agriculture has. Well, then of course we have to deal with this. More than 8 million people have seen this TED talk and many organizations are now using it as justification for furthering the livestock industry at the detriment of our planet. Grass-fed meat happens to be on the rise with sales doubling every year since 2006. And since we don't have another two or three hours to expound on this topic, I can offer you these sources to bolster your understanding about this argument. It's a very important read. I'll try to look that up in, in my book, uh, Food Choice and Sustainability. Well, this is, uh, this is one of those ideas that's not worth spreading. Alan Savory's methods have been proven not to work, but it's what 99% of the global population wanna hear. And the line of argument is becoming the latest buzz. Most of you probably have already heard this. He calls it holistic management, but it's essentially another term for grass-fed or pastured livestock systems, just like all the others you see on this list, all which equate to the continued loss of natural resources, suboptimal human health, and unnecessarily unnecessary slaughtering when any animals entered into the equation. Founded in 2014 and based off a best-selling book, Paul Hawken, who is a renowned author and environmental activist, developed a wide-ranging, well-funded, and influential project called Drawdown. But its focus is entirely on climate change, and so even if their objective uh, is to regenerate our depleted environment, the results of all their efforts are going to be very limited in scope. They also broadly advocate grass-fed livestock as the centerpiece of the future of food production which is unfortunate because it's wrong. And, and the movement called regenerative agriculture essentially repeats what all the rest of these methods are saying based on the Alan Savory holistic management concepts that we all need to eat animals and that hooved animals such as domesticated cows are necessary for humans to survive because there's no other way for healthy soil and production of food and for us can coexist. Well, on its surface, regenerative agriculture uh, sounds as if it's the one-stop shop solution to all of our environmental food choice issues, stating, well, it's about farming in a style that nourishes people in the earth with principles meant to restore soil and ecosystem health and address in inequity and leave our lands, water, and climate in better shape for future generations. All sounds great, but that's what plant-based systems do, however, in, in, better, in, 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 in a better fashion. However, proponents of this rapidly growing movement are not telling you that a number of unbiased and respected researchers point to the fact that these livestock methods, um, they create a higher carbon footprint than factory farm methods. And then they hide this fact behind other objectives that are used routinely in fully organic plant-based systems. So the, the primary argument that regenerative agriculture is needed to combat climate change is nonsensical because one acre of land that's reforested after kicking livestock off will sequ sequester up to 100 times more carbon dioxide 
from our atmosphere than if you left livestock on still grazing in, in the regenerative agriculture manners. You know, even a recent Harvard study revealed that converting all cattle operations to the United States or in the United States to manage grass-fed systems would conservatively require 30% more cattle than what, what we already have. And it'd create a 43% increase in methane emissions than what we are uh, generating with feedlot or factory farm raised cows, which of course defies all we need to accomplish. So it's too bad these scientists and livestock advocates are overlooking the fact that there are many examples and areas in the world that have been ravaged by livestock. Areas have been deforested, topsoil loss because of grazing. And now these areas are flourishing with, live, with wildlife and plants without the influence of any cattle or hooved animals. The theory that livestock are necessary for rebuilding soil and for our existence is completely erroneous. Uh, one perfect example is with this guy. Ernst Gutsch moved from Germany to a thousand acres of completely destroyed rainforest in Brazil called the dry wasteland because the, the rainforest was cut down and pigs and cattle ruined it. And then erosion occurred, topsoil was lost. And he began his form of agroforestry by planting bananas and cocoa. Notice you don't see any livestock here. This is what it looks like today. It's amazing what's come back. Proving that this reforestation and rebuilding of topsoil can be done in other climates other than tropical rainforest. Here's another perfect example that had more than 90% of the topsoil loss. Most of the animals and plants were exterminated or displaced. A decision was made to just let this land go to rest. No livestock, it wasn't touched. And a remarkable evolution began immediately when livestock and conventional row crop farming were removed. This amazing transformation took place. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like today. Insects, birds, animals reappeared, pollinators became plentiful. The two areas is before and after. And I know this is true uh, because this is what it looks like today. And it's an amazing story of regeneration without the need for livestock. And by the way, I had the opportunity to verify all this as being accurate and follow the story along every day since 1979, because this is our property. This is our rescue and sanctuary back in Michigan where my lovely wife, Jill, and I live, so I know it's true. In summary fashion, the meat that is produced from grass-fed, pastured, grazing livestock systems, regardless of what it happens to be called, is actually less sustainable than conventional grain-fed, factory-farmed meat, which of course is much less sustainable than plants for us to eat. There's a summary. As we run out of land and water, this, this metric that you see on the screen is gonna be coming quite important. How much feed, does it take to produce one pound of meat? The feed conversion ratio can be up to 71 for grazing systems. And please pay particular attention to the ratio for plant-based foods at the bottom of the slide. It's reversed. For plants, the ratio varies, but for broccoli, I picked out broccoli as an example, one pound of seed yields 16,000 pounds of food. Can anyone see the obvious implications for putting an end to, to world hunger here by displacing animal products? My statement that grass-fed livestock use more water than grain-fed has caused more arguments from prominent scientists in the room almost than any other, but it's a fact, and here's the data, which takes into account all sources of water, green, blue, gray. Now take a look for yourself, I just circled it. And then, of course, both types of livestock operations, grain or grass-fed, use 50 to 100 times more water than growing plants for us to eat directly. So about the model or example that New York City and Mayor Adams is following for Fridays for a school system, uh, uh, let's let's talk about the real quickly about the Go Meatless on Monday campaign. If you do this, if you if you go meatless on Mondays or Fridays or any other one day of the week, you're going to be contributing to climate change, pollution, and global depletion of our plants' resources and your own health on only six days of the week instead of seven. You're going to be creating a false justification for your actions on those other six days of the week. In other words. Please, let's not rest on the laurels of what you're doing right only one-seventh of the time. And what does eating less meat really mean quantitatively? I think this is important. Just in the, a little over an hour, hour and a half that I've been speaking here today, just in, in one hour, say, uh, over 9 million animals were slaughtered for us to eat in that one hour. 114,000 tons of grain were fed to livestock we're raising. But during that same one hour, 354 children in the world have died from starvation. Over 3,000 acres of tropical rainforest were destroyed and replaced by cattle, and over 3 million tons of greenhouse gases have been dumped into our, 
into our atmosphere by livestock. Therefore, I'm advocating a much different approach than what the United Nations and others suggest when they say we should just eat less meat because with that approach of eating less meat, only, only 8 million animals might be slaughtered in the next hour and only 113,000 tons of grain will be wasted, leaving only 353 children in the world that will starve to death in that one hour. Isn't that, isn't that what less means? So unlike Mark Bittman and Michael Pollan and the United Nations and all other eat less meat plant forward advocates, I think these numbers should be zero. It's easily attainable. There's no magic involved. Nothing has to be invented. No new, new technologies have to be employed. It's simply what we choose to eat and no children have to die from starvation. So it seems that we continue floating around in a zone that I call pseudo sustainability. That's exactly where we are today. Never getting to where we need to be, but thinking that we're sustainable. Well, it's a very dangerous predicament uh, to think you're something and really you're, you're not. And one more important definition that needs refinement, I think, is ethics, the ethical consideration of what we choose to eat. The topic of conscious eating has always been about animal rights, animal welfare, hasn't it? Something that at the onset, Chef AJ discussed with me that many people just aren't that interested in instead of their own health. But let's look at this, the life and death of other li living beings that we consume, how they're treated. Ethics usually has been about this, but now I think it's time to view conscious eating or ethics in a much different and a much larger context. Is it ethical, for instance, for any of us to eat food that causes the extinction of other species if we don't need to? Is it ethical for the vast majority of humans on earth to cause or contribute heavily to irreversible climate change, loss of ecosystems and resource depletion, while 2% of us are living our lives by way of food choice to protect Earth? Is it ethical for, ethical for any of us to use our planet in a way that exacerbates world hunger and diminishes the potential for future generations to survive? It also then becomes a matter of social justice, doesn't it? The person sitting next to you who's eating steak, pork, chicken, cheese, or fish, or even eggs, is taking away resources that could be spread more evenly, more efficiently, and used to support the life of perhaps 20 other people. Is it even ethical for 325 million Americans to impose their diet-related healthcare costs on the 10 million who choose to eat the right foods? So you see, it's time we rethink ethics. It needs to be framed much differently than that, than just with animal rights. In fact, I titled a chapter in my, my second book, uh, Why Should I Pay for What Everyone Else Decides to Eat? That's a good, good question. So it makes little sense then to continue doing what our predecessors did in the late 1800s and early 1900s when we didn't know any better. And there were far less mouths to feed, more land and water to do so. You know, so you have to ask yourself, I mean, uh, how many of you still use a typewriter or feather quill pen to write a message? Uh, how about the Pony Express or the Stagecoach to send those messages or to travel? And you think the internet's slow sometimes. <laughs> uh, how about candles or kerosene lamps to read with at night? Anybody out there still using those to read all my books with? Well, why not? Why, why aren't you using these things? I'll, I'll tell you why. Because they're obsolete. That's why we've outgrown them. They're inefficient. They don't fit. And so it is with all meat, dairy, and fish. The world on a global basis can no longer support the production of things, just these things, just like the typewriter, just like the stagecoach. We need to evolve past them. We need to do it today because the clock is ticking. You know, almost everything we do, every decision we make every day is based on our culture, what we've learned, what someone else has told us to be acceptable or necessary. After realizing that bloodletting what here wasn't so healthy for us after all, we miraculously stopped even though we've been doing it for 3000 years. Well, there are culturally driven practices we're accepting today, especially with food choices involving all animal products that are much more unhealthy for our planet and for us than bloodletting. And by all accounts, we don't have 3,000 years to get it right. So you might ask, why aren't we getting the truth from uh, about our food choices from those with platforms, those who are guiding us? Well, it's because of three reasons. First, many are comfortably unaware still. Or second, they are partially aware, but simply can't bring themselves around to making the right statement because they themselves consume animals. After all, how can we expect one of our leaders to guide us toward health and restoration of our planet if they can't even do it for themselves. And lastly, many of our leaders are afraid. They're afraid they're gonna lose their audience. Well, in the year 2000, the United Nations established eight Millennium Development Goals or MDGs. There are quantifiable goals to be achieved by the year 2015 that addresses important issues like world poverty, 
disease, gender inequality or gender equality, hunger, even environmental sustainability. And obviously the goals failed because all these issues still exist today. They're even a greater problem today than they were 22 years ago. One reason specifically for their failure is because these MDGs did not properly address the core problem of human rights, never accurately defined what environmental sustainability is supposed to mean or how to achieve it because they never properly positioned food choice or animal agriculture in their efforts. Human rights and environmental sustainability and food choice are deeply interconnected. Knowing that the MDGs ran out of time and they failed, the United Nations held a sustainability summit in 2015 where 193 nations uh, got together and adopted an agenda for sustainability and, and, they, and they adopted a whole new set of global goals to be achieved by the year 2030. Sure enough, now halfway into this timed agenda, many of their goals are further off course than seven years ago when they were established. As an example, look at their number two goal about promoting sustainable agriculture in order to end world hunger. Now, how's that ever gonna be ever happen if there's not a universal definition of the word sustainable and if that definition is not accurate? Well, every five years, the United States dietary guidelines are updated and these guidelines heavily influence many programs in the United States and Canada. In 2015, for the first time ever, it was recommended by their scientific advisory committee that these new dietary guidelines that, that affect just about everybody in the United States, they take into strong consideration the environment. So I was very encouraged to see this, but the most recent report two years ago doesn't include their findings or any discussion of food choice or the effects uh, on our environment. The scientific advisory committee stated that they, they consider these topics about science to be beyond the scope of the report. Well, many wonder how the recommendations of the 2015 advisory committee to include sustainability in, in our food choices, how these science-based recommendations could be so easily silenced by those who drafted the final dietary guidelines a couple of years ago in 2019. Now, how could that happen? Well, unfortunately, this is one big reason that it happened. This particular administration in 2018 and 19 restricted scientific input and it also, they also included 13 of the 20 dietary guideline members were found to have heavy ties to the meat and dairy industries. So it's very disappointing, but I'm very happy to see wonderful documentary films now that have been launched in the past eight years that are now being seen by millions around the world. Uh, wonderful films like this one to help matters. So if you haven't seen them, please take note. Uh, the Game Changers produced by my good friends, uh, Jim and Susie Cameron, who are working quite diligently behind the scenes to inform and revitalize the world. And then there's Food Choices, a beautifully crafted film by my good friend, Michal Siversky. And then of course, there's Cowspiracy uh, that was so artfully done by my good friends and colleagues, Kip and Keegan. And then the most recent, uh, Seaspiracy, written film produced by my good colleagues, Ali and Lucy Tabrizi, which brings, out, brings our oceans and fishing into clear focus, even though Cowspiracy, did, I thought did that quite well too. I was quite fortunate to be the lead consultant for a few of these films and would highly recommend that all of you guide everyone around you to watch these films as they really hit mar the mark on all levels. And in terms of increasing awareness, you can't be more efficient with introducing others to the problems that we are immersed in and just point your finger at these, you know, at the, or, or have a, a taste testing with these films. So when someone asks what they can do to help matters, watch these documentary films, spread the word, Many have asked me what they can do to help create positive change in the world regarding this environment issue. Well, these that you see on the screen are good starting points. Use some of Chef AJ's recipes. The choices we make together, particularly with things we consume, such as food, dictate supply, and therefore dicta dictates the use of our resources. It's not the industrial meat producer or the dairy factory farmer that's going to take down that last standing rainforest on earth. And it's not going to be the the large commercial fishing trawler that's responsible for catching the last poor single fish remaining in the sea. No, it's gonna be the human consumer who's demanding it. So remarkably, this statement was made almost a thousand years ago by someone who understood the environment and understood the animals around him. Knowing everything I talked about today, uh, there's certainly ample reason for feeling quite discouraged, isn't there? Anyone feeling discouraged out there? Yeah, I understand regarding loss of our planet's life systems, what we've done to our planet, there's so much bad news in the truth around us and, and increased awareness. It seems 
even with increased awareness, it seems we'll be constantly fighting an uphill battle. But in the midst of potential despair, there can be found great news. There's an easy solution to global depletion. We don't have to destroy our planet or ourselves to eat. In fact, that's the other way around. But we must change. And it is a choice. We need to substitute, replace, eliminate the practice of raising, slaughtering, and consuming animals. We must do it now. There's great news in all this because the food choices that are optimal for our planet's health, ha health happen to be the very same food choices that optimize our own health. So you know what? We, we can actually all be heroes. That's right. All of us. We could, we could even be, I mean, we could be superheroes swooping down and saving lives and saving our planet with every single thing we eat. This is the way we need to look at this every single day. Yeah, a superhero. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling better already. With no legal commitments and inadequate timelines, this last climate change conference, uh, COP26, left us once again pretty well off target. And there was no mention of the dramatic effects of animal agriculture. So let's go back to finish our discussions today. Let's go back just a, a, a few years, 10 years ago, to be specific. Something quite telling happened at the end of that annual global climate change conference. In her closing remarks, the executive secretary of the conference, Christiana Figueres, provide, provided a summary of the conclusions of NGOs, researchers, scientists, by stating this about our future and about climate change. She said this, the science is unquestionable. Therefore, despite the obvious effects on the industry itself, we must call for the elimination of the use of coal as an energy source. And she said, we must do this immediately. Notice that she didn't say we should use less coal. She didn't say we should use only local or humane coal. <laughs> I didn't hear her say that. And also I didn't hear her say we should all go coal less on Mondays. In fact, she said we should eliminate coal, even though coal carries with it less greenhouse gas emissions than raising livestock does. And coal has no real direct effect on water scarcity, world hunger, loss of biodiversity, our oceans, and all other areas of global depletion, but raising and eating animals does. So the door has been open, I think, perhaps inadvertently 10 years ago by Ms. Figueres and 200 nations. But as far as I'm concerned, the global stage for massive food choice change has already been set. If there's an imminent threat to our planet and to us, which there is, well, we should certainly be able to call for its elimination and for it to be done immediately. As a global community, you'd think at some point we'd have no difficulty joining arms to avert a well-defined catastrophic existential threat, maybe a looming nuclear war, a massive meteorite on a clear collision course with our planet. You'd think it'd become our number one priority without question, but the cause of our demise may never be one of these disasters. It may very well be something as simple as food choice. And the fact that it was never placed as our number one priority. So when we talk about definitions, it's time to finish reshaping the word sustainable. This is my definition. And if you think about it, we really don't wanna create a world that simply allows for our existence, our survival to be merely sustained. No, that's not good enough. So at this stage, we need to create a world where there's quick regeneration, rapid rejuvenation, a world where we and all other species together can flourish. That's, that's my vision. And we're the unique group of generations living right now that can make or break this opportunity. It'll be our defining ethos, our legacy by which future generations will remember us. Remember, it's not how healthy we are if our planet's not healthy. So I encourage and challenge everyone to become more aware about your food choices, seek more accurate definitions, understand the timelines that we're faced with, and then let's all commit to making a difference, but not just with our own health or with uh, our own life. No, let's Let's all commit to making a difference in someone else's life and a difference in the long-term health of our planet. But, but let's do it now, not, not later. We might not have a later. And let's think about making a difference every day of the week, not just on Mondays or Fridays. Hey, be a superhero for those around you, guiding them and saving lives every single day. That, my friends, is what sustainability and positive change to achieve it is really all about. So with that in mind, let's Let's all of us here today or watching this in the future, let's all of us go out and inspire others to become aware and then to act, knowing and doing. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, it was a bit of a presentation. I hope you stuck in there with me and I really appreciate your time. It's a, certainly a privilege for me to be here. Thank you.
Wow, Dr. Overlander, that was incredible. I feel like you need to pay for me to have a chiropractic appointment because <laughs> I'm just shaking my head for like an hour and a half, like in disbelief. Easy to do. I still do it. I mean, I try to not repeat myself, but some of the numbers, I just, you know, it's just astounding to me. But well, yeah, know, thank you. I, I've heard you talk before, but I've not heard you talk about lab grown meat before, because I guess it wasn't something that was actually going to happen. It was many years ago when I heard you speak. So yeah. that, I, I'm wondering how you feel about like the reducitarian movement that, that Brian Cateman is, is mm-hmm. uh, fronting, you know, because he just says not everybody's people are just not going to do it. So better to have yeah. less. Yeah. So a couple of things about that. Um, first is that Again, I have to defer to a couple of different slides that I had about the eating less movement, eating less meat movement. You know, maybe that could have applied 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. We we're on timelines that we're surpassing them. The reason we're surpassing them is because we're there, the, we, we're, we're, we're eating what we need to do. We're not doing. So if you're reducing, if you're eating less of something, but it's still contributing to global depletion, um, it's, it's not going to solve the problem. So, you know, in other words, those numbers that I was giving, you know, earlier on, um, with all those numbers, if, if, if we uh, diminished our, our animal products to zero, you, we actually could see complete reversal of climate change. So it, the, the largest problem I have with e- eating less meat is that all the, all the issues are still in front of us and everything, it just contributes to the problem. And, and it's subjective. There's no metric. So what is what does that mean? You know what does that mean? And I, I was being a little facetious on a couple of slides. Like, you know, you eat. In fact, there's 80, 80, 84 million tons of beef were produced last year. So what does eating less meat mean? Eighty three million tons. And you know, again, you you have so so it's nonsensical. I find it interesting, and and it's it's for people who can't think outside the box, and for people who really don't care about. They can't see. They, they either are unaware, like I said, some individuals are still unaware. I, I believe that, but more and more have access to, you know, to the knowledge that of some of the, some of what I've presented here today. So no, I'm highly against it, and I don't I don't know what to say. It's a, uh, it's it's discouraging for me to see that our people with a platform are advocating the continuation of destruction by saying, let's just eat, let's, let's do less destruction, destruction. You know, it's kind of like, in a way, it's kind of like Russia, you know, ask Russia, you know, for, for everybody to accept Russia doing less of what they're doing is unacceptable. They need to, they need to do, they need to stop doing what they're doing and then rebuild everything that's there. And that's really very similar to, to what I'm talking about. You know, the message I, I'm trying to, you know, to relate about food choice, you know, we have, we have damaged our planet. We need to, re, we need to restore it and we need to do it right away today. And chef, AJ, you know, as well as anybody, it's not a, it's really not a matter of, you know, taste preferences anymore. It's something that that, they just, you know, I mean, I I don't know all about your story, but, you know, I was a meat and potatoes person entirely until, until, until graduate school and I changed. I'm, I'm absolutely nothing special. So if I can change, anybody can change. Like I said, at the beginning, you can't legislate compassion. (laughs) No, no, you can't, but, but. I believe we have multi, we have, it's a multi-dimensional, many level, pro, you know, project. Like we need to have an eco and health risk tax. We need, we need to transition jobs. We need to create incentives. And there's a way to, way to do that. It's just going to take some effort. It's going to take a, a broad effort by those with platforms that, that know it can be done and have the, and have the solutions in front of them. So, um, so anyway, um, it's, it's a very difficult situation to know that, you know, that, that those with platforms are accepting just a lesson, a lesson version of all this damage that we're doing. Gina would like to know, have you ever done a Ted talk? No, I haven't. And I was going to, and then I was pulled into a number of just before, you know, Ty was became ill. Um, I was pulled into a number of different organizations to, to work through specifically with think tanks and world hunger organizations. And I didn't, I didn't have time, uh, but I probably could do it now. So I think it's a great idea. You know, when it came to lab grown meat, the reason that I thought I might be in favor for it is just because before we logged on to the live, I mentioned that my dog Bailey is like almost completely vegan now. And I would feel more comfortable if I had a pet, especially if I had a cat giving that pet 
lab grown meat? Yeah, well, okay, so there's an argument, as I mentioned, when, when I had that segment, there's an argument for it. And like I said, Bill Gates has invested a tremendous amount of money, and it's actually, it's going to, going to proliferate pretty quickly. Um, but the issue is, is that, you know, you've got all those components that have not been solved, you know, they're still using, you know, fetal calf, you know, uh, bovine um, serum. And from an environmental standpoint, you're just, you're just deterring the, you know, it's like a, a slight shift away from, in fact, how are we going to solve all the climate change issues if, you know, if we don't really restore everything correctly? And the way to do that is to, is to work through complete plant-based systems. And, and again, you know, there's a tremendous amount of difficulty with, uh, you're still going to have the you know, much of the human health aspects uh, in those two slides that I brought up too. Right. I, I I didn't mean it for human consumption, but like, for example, I've never had a cat. I would like to have a cat one day. And if I did have a cat, I would rather do that because I feel it's the more compassionate choice. And then we could maybe shut down some of these factory farms. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, you know, you're looking at choices for, for a pet, you know, like a, or, or you know, a rescued, um, you know, cat or dog, and certainly between between the options, that's a better one. Yeah, I mean, I'd mentioned that there's like the four D's that most you know, uh, uh, cat and 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 dog food manufacturers you know provide, for, and that's not healthy at all. So you're right, it's a it's a step in the right direction, but you know, that's not gonna that that in itself is not going to affect you know the massive amounts of global depletion that we have anyway. So you're right, it's a good choice for you. So we have a question from a live viewer. Do the experts in your field agree that animal agriculture is the top reason for global warming? And if not, what are the points of contention? Right. So, you know, you saw that quick sequence I did with, uh, with uh, the percentages for uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the livestock industry, ranging from, you know, 14.5% to 18% up to 87%. So most in the field, most experts that are considered experts, that are unbiased experts, do not, do not agree with the lower numbers and they don't necessarily agree with uh, Dr. Rao's, no, I mean, no offense to him, I love him, you know, I love his work, but they don't agree with 87%, um, but he brings up some good points. So, so my, my point, my perspective and in, in the way that I presented this today and my own thoughts is that um, animal agriculture is responsible, the single sector most responsible for all aspects of global depletion, climate change being one of them, and uh, by far. And, and it's one of, it's, if it's not at 87% greenhouse gas emissions, uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, it's likely closer to 30, 37, 51%, which is still uh, the, one of the major contributors, if not the major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, which then causes global warming, which then causes climate change. So I like to look at it as a more as a, I don't want to focus on climate change. In fact, I think, I don't know if you left part of that title up, but you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't want, we're, we're, the door has been opened by, by a number of individuals and, and organizations being very concerned about climate change. So the door has been open, but climate change is not the single largest problem that we have facing us. It's an exacerbator of, of, of things that we already have occurring right now today. So animal agriculture is the leading cause, whether it's on land or in our oceans, of all those other eight areas and those planetary boundaries that we've passed. And climate change is just an exacerbator of that. But yes, so animal agriculture is the major contributor to all those. And it's the leading, if it's one of the leaders, if not the leading cause of global warming. So Mark wanted to know, is there any way to solve the climate emergency without a worldwide vegan transformation? Well, there, there likely could be a technology uh, method, but as I tried to point out pretty eloquently, but also starkly in a stark manner, is that the easiest solution and the one that's most comprehensive is simply going to a plant-based diet, because what you're going to do is you're going to be uh, you're going to be dropping down, uh, you're going to be eliminating essentially all current greenhouse gases other than from natural causes and some from gas and oil industry, which there are already taxations being applied to them. So that'll take care of itself. Uh, but the majority of greenhouse gases uh, are, are still being caused, whether you're, you're talking about methane or carbon dioxide by animal agriculture and also by land use optimization, you know, that little section I gave about how land is used. So 
um, the, solu the easiest solution, the quickest solution to eliminate uh, the current greenhouse gas emissions, as well as drop down the 400, 420 parts per million that we're at now, is to reforest, rewild, and do not have, you know, do not have any livestock taking up any resources because we're, we're also going to be we're also running out of fresh water too so i mean we need to we need to combat all these so if you start fragmenting it and, and think well let's wait for a te technological advancement you know to pull down you know i went over that with one of the slides that it's it's just not going to happen in our lifetime to to have it occur correctly if we don't address diet or food choice so it's just it's just the easiest way to do it shortest amount of time and it will uh, have a larger effect on full global depletion. Yeah. I don't know if that's, a, I mean, the short answer is, yes, we could wait for technology, wait for these, you know, these uh, $450 million units uh, times X amount of, you know, the one quadrillion, you know, number that I gave, wait 100 years. But likely most humans won't be around in 100 years if we, if we allow that to happen. And so, you know, it's just, it's very simple. The math I provided and this, the pathway to get there and solving all aspects of global depletion is, is very simple. So we just need to kind of focus on that, I think. Well, as wonderful as your talk was, a live viewer named Jennifer says this is seriously depressing and overwhelming, not your talk, but the subject, because the people sure. that need to hear this aren't the ones that are watching, unfortunately. Right, right. Well, yeah. So the issue is, again, we're going to have to have a bottom up, uh, top down approach. Um, I have spoken to the European Parliament. I've spoken to a number of think tanks. I've uh, on behalf of uh, a number of scientists, I believe the, in, in what I believe in, I've spoken to um, a number of uh, scientists in uh, overseas in settings that are arguing this point and trying to work with policymakers. So I just haven't been in the mix for five years because of what I mentioned earlier. So, um, so I think we need to continue working with education and then work from the top down there. I, I, I placed a number of slides showing all the jobs that can be created. They're very easy to, to accomplish. We just have to get moving on those instruments, you know, those people, those policymakers, those organizations that are in a position to do something about it, to move it forward. So I'm, I agree. Was it, was it with Jennifer? You said, I agree. It can be, you know, very, you know, disheartening, but also I hope that I laid out, you know, ways I didn't just uh, provide a deluge of, you know, of disgustingly, you know, disappointing, disparaging, you know, um, facts and figures and then leave the, you know, say goodbye, AJ. You know, I came up, I, I presented ways we can get, get through this. So there is a lot of hope, but we are on timelines. I mean, the thing is, is that it's a fine line to walk, isn't there? You can be just, a, you can be, you know, frustrated and, you know, feel like it's hopeless, but there are ways that we can get to that point. And I think that everybody that is in the know needs to move forward as best as possible spread the word as much as possible from bottom up, talk to policymakers, run for run for office if you think that they're not addressing it, you know, correctly. Let's get in. And, and the door's been open though because of climate change. So I think that, you know, use that as a as a as a you know platform. Yeah. Kathy says this is so critically important. Can you please make a documentary? The environmental issue really speaks to youth and it's their future that's in peril. Yeah. That's an excellent point. We do have a couple other documentaries in the works. I've got a couple of books that I'm I'm uh, trying to trying to finish, and um, the, one of the documentaries and one of the books is indeed um, aimed towards our youth and understanding this, and because they're you know they're going to be affected, they can teach their parents, you know, and there's a fine line with that too. They need to be they need to be educated to understand where their food choices are coming from and you know what effect it has on our environment, but without making them feel as if, you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, that they're going to have nightmares about it, basically. But um, yes, we, uh, documentaries are a great way to do it. And I'm, I'm working on that as soon as I, I, I'm off of this Zoom. That's one of the things I'm going to be working on tonight. Nice. So great, great question. Yeah. Yeah. Gary wants to know, is it animal agriculture that is responsible for the fires that are plaguing the West? <laughs> Well, that's a that's a tricky question. Wanting probably a tricky a tricky answer, um, because you know it depends what level you're looking at. The you know the animal agriculture likely didn't drop the match or start the fire or leave it you know or, or leave the power line you know insufficient. Um, but um, the dryness that exacerbated the fires, yes, it's 
it's minimally minimally 50% responsible for methane uh, uh, being a, being uh, emitted into our atmosphere, and and minimally probably again 37 to 87% its responsibility for the carbon dioxide being emitted, and that then fuels climate change, which then fuels the dryness and the lack of precipitation or the heavy storms. You know, it's a wild you know uh, fluctuation. So yes. Um, it isn't responsible for the fire starting itself, but it's responsible for the depth of severity. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you don't realize some of these questions came in while you were talking, but this is a really important point Gina makes. How do we help all the people make livings when their livelihoods go away? Because I think that's a big right. part of the meat eating industry, because I don't yes. think really any factory farm worker aspired to that job when he was growing up. Right. Well, yeah, and that's a great question. And you are right. Um, um, they probably missed that section. I mean, that's one reason I'm, I didn't have, I had generalities over the last 20 years of my thoughts on eco tax and healthcare tax and how jobs could be transitioned, always, always moving from the global subsidies. But now, as you saw from the presentation, there's a number of slides that uh, hopefully will still be available for any of your viewers and anybody else in the world to look at, where it states specifically those jobs that can be transitioned from land-based uh, animal agriculture uh, occupations to plant-based um, plant occupations. And, and also in a separate slide about a number of, of, uh, of jobs that can be transitioned from all those involved in the fishing industry. And then I also gave numbers and how many dollars are, can be used. And the dollars are, are split between those that can just generate new revenues and um, as well as uh, from the $770 billion. That's a, that's a lot of money, almost a trillion dollars, you know, that are used to prop up the meat, dairy and fishing industry. So we just reposition that and nobody will have to lose their jobs. In fact, you know, as I pointed out, I think it's really close to 200 million new jobs can be created um by the year 2030 and likely more can be spun off of it as we move along but this is just you know between reforesting uh and all those other jobs that you know i i pointed out so yeah i i'm not giving generality so much anymore as backing it up with and also it's not just my idea i mean most of it is but i also placed in there i think you you saw the world economic forum has did their own study with mul multiple multi layered uh, scientists and countries and came up with their own numbers and theirs are very close to mine. So yeah, they're not going to lose their job. Right. And she did, gain, she, did ask that before, she did ask that before your, 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 yeah. uh, the slides came up, but I just think that's a, an important point for people. It's a great, it's a great question. So really I'm glad we just re-emphasized re right. it now. So good. Okay. Here's a question I wouldn't have thought to ask, but now I'm curious. Mary says, what are you wearing on your wrists? Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm not, you're not supposed to see anything and I'm really <laughs> oh. have a, a personal note. No, but it's, uh, it's just, it's just uh, a couple of bands to remind me that we need to inspire awareness now. Um, just some, a little trinket to remind me that, you know, I have a mission every day and uh, I, I need to save lives. However, okay. I can do it. Elizabeth wants to know, have you ever met Greta Thunberg? I haven't. She came on the, um, she came on the stage right after Ty was diagnosed, like 2018. Um, and so I sent, uh, I had written uh, a quick note of um, appreciation to her and a couple of my books, but also pointed out, <laughs> much like I do, you know, I take the positives and put in some things that they need to work on, but also position that it's not just climate change and we need to be worried about. And um, and it's not just fossil fuels, because that's what most of her, most of the, her objective was, um, was targeted at. So she's, I can't say enough about her, but um, I had written that off and then thought, uh, I'm not going to, I don't know how much I can follow up on this. So I'd never sent it to her. But that's another thing. I'm taking notes here to remind myself of what I need to continue doing with it. Uh, so I'm writing a little note to Greta and pulling that back out. So yeah. So on one hand, she's doing some great things. Wonderful. Can't say enough about her. On the other hand, uh, I wish I would have sent that off now. I just, I knew I couldn't follow up on it. If she would have written back or wanted to meet or whatever, I, I just couldn't do it. I, I had to kind of cut everything for five years, but, but she still needs to know, she still needs to be aware of like this presentation, you know, because she is focused on 
gas and oil and fossil fuels and climate change. But again, she's very open to, I'm sure, to all the other aspects of global depletion. Nice. I hope I pronounced the viewer's name right, Lavanga or Lavanja. She says, but do we want to kick all the cows, pigs, chickens off the planet? Can we give them a place to live happily and make our lives richer just by their presence? I totally get that we are breeding ridiculously, but I personally would be so sad to never see a cow again. And also, don't we need their fertilizer? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to buy that out. This the, the last question is the most pronounced because that type of thought is exactly what's uh, keeping us in, in trouble. And with the regenerative agriculture, obviously we do not need that. And that was, I've spelled that out very well during my regenerative agriculture series of, of slides in terms of how, how uh, narrow-minded and overly focused those, you know, like the regenerative agriculture movement and Paul Hawken movement, all those are based on the need, the pseudo need, uh, which is really just wanting to perpetuate uh, animal agriculture and livestock, and no, I'm and I, I placed. I'm sure that she could go back and watch those uh, those examples I gave of one in the on the Amazon and one of, of our own property where we just booted off livestock and it's it's flourishing. And so you know we do not need their, we do not need uh, livestock you know for any of that. So it's a common. It's one of the most ridiculous myths I've ever heard of other than, you know, we need to drink cow's milk to, to be, you know, healthy for our own human health. Um, so in any event, and the other aspects to that are, are that, um, that, yeah, we, we could, uh, I've been asked this before, what happens to all of those animals? Well, it's going to take about, you know, the, I don't know if she, um, if she herself or any of the other viewers have actually cared for a, a rescued cow or pig, but you know, the breeding, and we have many, and the breeding is such that they typically have so many issues, even at our wonderful sanctuary, they still don't, you know, like turkeys will come off the crate, and we have to be very careful, they don't have a heart attack, just seeing sun for the first time, you know, they're just bred so inadequately, I mean, for strength, you know, just to just to grow quickly, gain weight, and slaughter, and eat, so, so right, so they typically, the ones that are bred right now, typically will live maybe eight to 10 years. And that's going to be about how long it's going to take to transition um, the, the four to five billion hectares in the world to from uh, uh, pastured lands to, you know, to, to, uh, to forests. And similarly with our oceans, it's going to take about, um, about five to 10 years for things to be transitioned carefully. So what we need to do is stop breeding, first of all, right now. And then the ones that uh, remain, yeah, we can find homes for them and they'll gradually be, you know, they're all born at different times. And so it's not going to be as if we have to either A, slaughter them off. I'm not for any of that whatsoever. And it's not going to be as if they all die off all at once. And it's also not going to be as if they all live forever. And so I think the five, the eight to 10 year period of time, by the time reforestation really starts drawing down the carbon, the excess carbon dioxide, you know, appropriately so that we start reversing out um, climate change is, is about how long it takes for those cows and, and pigs to, you know, to live out their lives. And, um, I, and there's still cows and pigs uh, out there that need help. I mean, there's, you know, any, any of the wild, you know, pigs or boars, they need help. There's some that need help here and there. There's wild animals that need help too. So I get it, you know, that you'd hate to not see a cow again, but uh, I just I just think in the enormity that the, the problem at hand right now is we have to focus on what we need to do in a general aspect to, you know, to, re, to, re, to eliminate all those factors from animal agriculture that are causing all the all all components of global depletion. And the only way to do that is to stop breeding and stop eating them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a question. Do you think there are certain countries that might change to a plant-based diet or an all plant-based diet first? Yeah. Great question. Because as I said, I mean, I've spoken to a number of think tanks, a number of different scientists from different countries, uh, and I spoke to the European Parliament. And of those, uh, I believe there are, I mean, right now it's very difficult, you know, to discuss any of this with what's going on in Europe with Ukraine and Russia. But um, but then again, long term, you know, it's our food choice that's going to, you know, be the, should be at the top of the list every day for everybody. And so I think there will likely be, there are a couple of countries that have leaders um, that have at least contacted me and their leaders that are in positions that are trying to have to make change happen much quicker than what we can what we're doing in the United States. In the United States, we're going to have to 
we're gonna have to do a number of things. We're gonna have to uh, uh, have somebody somewhere in the leadership capacity start uh, enlisting others, you know, and right now, I mean, the political system in the United States is just, you know, we've got a lot of other issues too, but short answer is yes, there likely will be a country that'll go, that'll, the ones that I'm thinking of in particular will likely be plant-based soon. There are ones that are already uh, making changes to reduce their carbon footprint in all other areas. And again, you know, carbon footprint or, or the uh, climate change is just one aspect of global depletion. So once they, once they, you know, start moving in that direction a little further, I'd say by the year 2030, you're going to see some countries inching very closely to complete plant-based systems. That's fantastic. So Melanie says, Dr. Openlander, you work so hard. Do you ever get a chance to recharge and how? <laughs> that's, that's a real kind question. <laughs> I, uh, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, uh, it depends on what, how you, um, you know, how you qualify or quantify recharge. Cause I'll go for a number of nights without sleeping uh, because I have, I'm too obsessed by trying to finish something, but then I'll have an oasis of sleep for a couple of days and I always catch up and there's not a problem. Um, and then, and then I recharge. I feel uh, every day I have a, a, you know, like I feel like I'm semi recharging right now, just looking at beautiful AJ on the on the screen and, and, and thinking that there's some, somebody out there that is listening to a message that might make a change and save lives. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm recharged just by doing this. And so, uh, yeah, I, and every day I always do something uh, physically and mentally at the same time, like run or, 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 or walk. You know, I have on my own period um, that I do that every day too. So I recharge. So thank you for the question. That was very kind. All right. All right. Well, you look, I mean, I haven't seen you in five years and it's like time stood still because you haven't aged. <laughs> well, I, well, I appreciate that. I, I'm going to have my 70th birthday here in a couple, couple months soon. Oh so, my God. You know. Are you kidding me? Oh, uh, no, I'm not kidding. So, so I don't know where the time has gone, but you know, I'm from the sixties. So <laughs> Whoa, you know, the I would, I, I mean, I would have thought you were maybe 50. I can't, I cannot believe no. it. That's well, incredible. <laughs> but, but, but you know what? It's, it's from what I eat. <laughs> yeah. I've, so, so you probably, it's probably been over 50 years for you or close to 50. It has. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. It's been 1970, about 70, 70, wow. 71. You got me beat by yeah. About six years. Incredible. Incredible. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. So um, Sunita says, what are your thoughts on the save the soil campaign that is currently going on? Yeah. So save the soil has to be, I think, um, looked at in a couple different categories because there are a couple different save the soil campaigns. One is what I was mentioning, you know, this, the, the decade from the uh, concerned scientists about the decade of, of soil and biodiversity. And and they're again, they've missed the target entirely. They're, um, you know, their uh, their primary uh, focus is how to not compact soil any further, and what to do with plastics and trash, and how to avoid erosion and deforestation. But they're not again. They have at the forefront should be how to eliminate animal agriculture because that's really livestock and grazing livestock and conventional row crop uh, for feed crops is what's really causing most of the soil. Uh, loss and degradation and erosion. But the other portion of that is that, um, or the other, um, the other, I think, uh, um, movement is where it's save the soil is also, uh, some of that's being taken up by these regenerative agriculture, um, you know, the holistic, holistic management uh, uh, movement. And they think they're saving the soil by hooved animals. And as I mentioned a number of times, it's, it's been the opposite it's been the opposite entirely until they started rotating, you know, their pastures. And now, as I said, it's, you can, you can, uh, you know, in terms of the biodiversity and water loss and land use and, and carbon dioxide and methane emissions. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a ridiculous argument to even discuss. It, the only people that really uh, want to argue with you that aren't looking at the facts as I presented them here, which are all very easily substantiated, um, are the ones that want to perpetuate it by they're either the, the industry itself or they're eating it. They're consuming meat or they're producing it. Um, but anybody else that looks at save the, using save the soil as part of the component of um, regenerative agriculture knows that the only way you can really truly save the soil and rebuild it is by uh, using fully organically grown plant-based systems. 
Yeah. Well, you mentioned carbon dioxide and methane and Kathy, who's watching live says, well, which one is more damaging or are they the same thing? Oh. The terminology can be confusing for people who have not yet heard this message. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is. And that's what I tried to state at the beginning of the climate change segment that I had. So she can uh, listen to that once more, but in a summary fashion, um, there are basically three primary uh, greenhouse gases that we should be concerned about. Carbon dioxide is one, methane is another, and nitrous oxide is another. Well, carbon dioxide is is the most prevalent at about 75%. And it's being, it's, it's what's emitted through all of our transportation and cars, and it's things we use every day that's right in front of us. And that's what the focus of attention is. But, but, and so because it's the most heavily emitted and because it lingers in the environment or it lingers in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years, we should be concerned about it. But, but the issue is, is that um, the, the, the one that's the most damaging 120 times as powerful as carbon dioxide is methane at the time of, of emission. And we can, in most of the methane emissions, uh, almost half of, of, of human induced emissions are from livestock or from animal agriculture. So why are they, where they both are important, um, you, you can, in other words, you can continue emitting all the, all the carbon dioxide you want with all the cars, don't do anything with cars. You know, all the attention has been given on cars, don't do anything. Just switch to a plant-based diet, change all the, check, kick all the livestock off and plant all trees for the 4 million hectares. And you would be able to draw down every bit of carbon dioxide that's being emitted by all the cars. Now, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should still, you know, obviously work towards renewables as soon as possible. But um, so, so I'm, I'm blending a couple of concepts here. Both of them are important. Carbon dioxide hangs out a little bit longer. It's the one we're most focused on. It's the most most damaging over a period of two to 300 years, but uh, methane is the most easily uh, addressed right now, purely from food choice. And if we switched out our agricultural systems, it would draw down all that carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. So they both present a slightly different problem and slightly, you know, um, you know, different long-term, you know, issue, but we can address both of them within the next five years to 10 years very easily. Yeah. Uh, Jean, Jean would like me to let you know that she's planning a curriculum for her students in Costa Rica based on your presentation today. Oh, well, I mean, that's that's great news. See, this is uh, this is rejuvenating me. This is what answering the last question, you know, this gives me a great hope and uh, makes me feel really great. So thank you. That's great. And I'll be available if they if she'd like to contact me. We'll have facts and figures with references for everything that I have on this and also I have, as you know, uh, AJ, I have a number of other facts and figures and data and perspectives that I couldn't, I didn't have time to present here today. But any, any curriculum that needs my assistance with referencing or some tactful way in terms of per, uh, perceiving it or, or presenting it, I'd be more than happy to help out. So just write to me at one of my websites, either comfortablyunaware.com or inspireawarenessnow.org. And, you know, I'd be happy to help out. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, um, a couple, couple of people have posted in the chat because uh, we're talking about, you know, how incredible you look. People thought you were 35, 50, oh, and you're saying we're both a couple of spring chickens. And <laughs> while that's a compliment, you that's know, compliment. the origin of the word is actually, you know, a spring chicken were the ones right. that were going right. to be eaten and yep. slaughtered. That's right. And that's I right. find it really interesting. And I'm actually thinking I have I have three books I've already committed to, but I had this idea for one day to write a book about how it's interesting how so many sayings are based on cruelty to animals. That's exactly right. Yeah. Skin a, more than one way to skin a cat. There's, you know, on and on and on, you know, it's, uh, and uh, there's so many with those that we eat, you know, that, yeah, there's no question. Yeah. It, yep. It's unfortunate, but you, yeah. you do, you, you look more like just a springtime flower. <laughs> not 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 a spring chicken. So. Oh my god! Uh, keep going. No, I'm kidding. But if there's anything, <laughs> just if there's anything you didn't present today, please feel free always to have a platform to present it. You know, a few people are saying, "Well, what can we do?" And by we, I think the person means those of us that are already vegan. Some of us, almost as long as you, me, forty five years. I mean, what more can I do? Because, you know, when I think about it, I have I had some friends over for dinner and new friends, actually, and they're vegan doctors here because I've just moved to a new city and they uh, they still go fishing. Not a lot, but they enjoy it. I mean, 
I, what do I do? Shame them? Tell them I can't be. I mean, no. like, I, I don't know what to do to get people to not do the things they're doing without completely alienating them. That's right. Well, OK, so great, great question. Um, but I feel like everyone uh, who already adopted has adopted a plant based diet can be leaders in a tactful way by using those tools that I've that I suggested here and some others that you're already aware of, but like use the section of of nociceptors for them and just and just present that to them. Play Seaspiracy for them. Play Cowspiracy for them while you're doing some taste testing of some great new dish you have. And then highlight that section of my presentation here about nociceptors. You know, do any of you have nociceptors? They know what nociceptors are. They know that they have 28, 23 to 28 nociceptors around their face themselves. And fish have been well documented that they have those. So while they're out fishing, they'd have to, you know, after your after your taste testing and they watch Seaspiracy and watch that little, my segment's only going to be like five minutes on nociceptors, I think, that I use here in the presentation. After they see that, they're going to go out and think, you know, Chef AJ, uh, you know, what she presented to us, I, I don't think I want to fish anymore. They're going to see the fish, you know, jerking from its, you know, hook in its mouth and, and they're going to, you know, realize, you know, that it's, it's, it's not appropriate to do that um, from a lot of standpoints. It's not, it's not fundamentally uh, empathetic. It's not fundamentally compassionate. And it's then obviously, as you know, eating fish as they should know by now is not that healthy, you know, for, for them as a human. So anyway, that's the way that you can, I think using the tools we have in, a, in, in even smaller, larger settings, to guide people, you know, tactfully. I think that's that's the goal that we have at hand. And then and then also do the same thing for politicians that need to make some decisions on with a, a platform of influence. And anybody that you know uh, that has a larger platform of influence, start writing to them and say, "Hey, watch Dr. Oakenander's presentation here." And and uh, and then by the way, we need to use some of our uh, global subsidies to to start transitioning jobs. Um, so that's the way I would I would do it. What I think I might do is just send them your presentation. Because <laughs> yeah. any, anytime yeah. I've ever done that, I've just offended people and they just don't want to talk to me again. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that that that's unfortunate because that's that's the wall that we're running up against. But, you know, I think. I think, I think it's because they know they're doing something wrong, because if they right. weren't, they wouldn't be embarrassed right. and offended. And, you know, I don't know, but, you know, you know how people right. are. Um, so, yeah, I do. But so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject something here um, because, AJ, at the, at, the, at the forefront here, you, you mentioned that, you know, much of your audience would rather listen to or, or, or tune in for human health. Well, this is a good this is a good thing. Then 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 you can use this presentation, and say, hey. I, I know the human health is of great value too, but hey, this this is a new uh, is a new presentation about our environment, and I think that everyone needs to know because our footprint is for is affecting our environment every single day. And here's how, and I'm not even going to talk to you about it. Just watch this presentation, and that's the way I think you combat both things. You you assist well three things. You assist the fish. You assist the person who's you know indiscriminately almost you know uh, killing the fish. And eating them or killing them and putting them back in there, making them go through pain. And you're increasing the, the knowledge base. You know, hopefully you'll you change their. I haven't met anybody in my practice that hasn't stopped eating fish uh, after they watched Seaspiracy. I, I haven't met one. And, you know, out of hundreds have wa that have watched that. So, so when you're working on patients, do you have it like playing in the office or like do you just say things to them? We, we offer it, we offer it to them and yet the, at the right time. You know, we'll say, hey, you know, do you, do you know much about your food choice and, and the environment now? Because we're talking to him about human health as well. And we'll say, well, a much broader picture is how your food choices affect other people in the world. You know, if those physicians that fish really watch the part about even what they eat here affects, you know, uh, our oceans or affects uh, the, the, the island countries in Kiribati or Maldives, I mean, it puts a different perspective on really the bubble that we live in. So, um, so anyway, I hope that helps a little bit. Right. Here's a question. Uh, have you ever done, or would you be willing to debate other experts who don't agree that going fully plant-based is the answer, or maybe with influencers who push meat heavy diets like Joe Rogan? I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, I had to switch out my, my ear buds. 
Oh, have you ever debated experts who don't agree? With yeah, you? lots, lots of them. In fact, I haven't gone into a setting where it's a formal debate. It's usually established as I forgot if you saw one of the slides where I was at the Scripps Institute, um, you know, Scripps Research Institute in, in uh, San Diego. So I've been to a number of uh, set settings like that and also overseas. I can remember a number of them in uh, Belgium and also in London where I'm there to to um, to present for about 15 minutes the knowledge that I have with other other scientists and um, and then but it ends up being so it's so it's under the under the preface that that um, that it's going to be a learning experience and and others are there like World Wildlife Fund had representatives there uh, at a lot of these uh, meetings but it ends up being more of an intellectual debate because. Uh, 99% of the other scientists that are in the room all consume animal products and they, they didn't want to hear it. So they end up, uh, uh, you know, almost arguing the, the points, but, the, but there's not much to argue if you know the facts and figures and there really isn't. I mean, if you look at, well, how can we best um, draw down carbon dioxide? Well, you know, if you know all the facts and figures and know how you can draw it down, there's really not an argument. Um, if you look at what, you know, what, you know, the laboratory meat is doing and how it's, you know, how it's made and what components of it can still damage human health. Damage meaning, you know, uh, create a predisposition to some other, you know, it's not going to give you cancer, but it's going to predispose you to, um, to certain conditions. Well, if you know those facts and figures, um, it ends up not really being an argument other than those that just don't want to change. They just don't want to change, you know, and that's a shame. But yes, the short answer is I've been in a number of of settings with other scientists and you know, think tank type uh, individuals where uh, it ends up being an intellectual, you know, I'm there to present, but it ends up being an intellectual sort of argument. The question, do humans produce methane? Yeah, well, humans, uh, I, I haven't, uh, I'm sure humans do pr produce methane in a very small uh, quantities of, of their own. You're talking about Either through gaseous excrements or urine, um, so I'm sure I am, you know, certain. And certainly, we produce, um, you know, carbon dioxide, but it's also it's it's interchanged uh, with the atmosphere in somewhat of a balanced fashion. Um, whereas, continuation of the big difference is continuation of the breeding and of livestock and uh, how long they live and how, and also what feed, you know, what foods they're eating, especially grass fed or grazing, um, create just such an overabundance of methane. So the major cause, even though we may produce a small amount, I don't know exactly what that is because it's, I think it's, it's much less than what we need to be concerned about right now. So the majority of the concern should be on those fat on those, you know, those industries and, and uh, those segments that are, or sectors that are creating the most amount of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. What are your thoughts on specific populations that live on the wilds of their land, like the Inuit or like the Hadza? Yeah, well, I think it's a, I think it's perfectly fine. I mean, I'm not right now at this point in time, you know, you, their population, uh, again, it's a matter of how much, you know, how much they know and where their culture has been. Um, I can tell you this much, that, you know, certain studies uh, just a few years ago came out showing that indigenous, uh, indigenous individuals and tribes living near uh, water systems have been have have decimated their reef systems and decimated their their populations of, of uh, other animals because they they you know, no one's told them, you know, about uh, biodiversity. No one's and they just continue eating, you know eating animal products off, off of their, their small little lo location. Um, and you know, that whole, that whole, that whole theory is about, um, evolution anyway, you know, the, the hunter gatherers, it's like, how did, you know, how did, uh, all the woolly mammoths become, you know, disappear? Well, it's, if, you know, certain, uh, anthropologists would tell you that evolutionary experts would tell you that oh, it's because humans, you know, kept, kept killing them and followed the woolly mammoth, you know, until there were no woolly mammoths left, you know, and there's others, there's others who have other, you know, uh, um, who, who think otherwise. But so I think, I think uh, human populations today, 
that are small, a very, very small fragment of our total global population. Um, you know, are, are the ones that are living in a very small area that, are, well, I also, a good example of the pygmies in certain pockets of Africa, you know, they've decimated all the animals in their little pockets. So they don't have a choice. Uh, and so someone will have to go in and explain to them and help them, you know, revamp their agricultural systems because they they don't have the ability to just move, you know, nomadically to another jungle, you know, because we're, we've run out of like 93% of all the tropical forests in Africa have already been decimated. So there are small pockets of populations of, of humans that um, are either mostly plant-based or mostly animal, you know, product driven, but you know, those aren't the ones that are causing all the issues in, in the world. Great, thank you. You know, what can we do to support you? Do you, uh, do you want us to buy your books? Do you have a social media following? What can we do to help you so that you can retire? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm never gonna retire. So, um, so I, that's a great question. And so I'll answer that two different ways. I mean, the first is just, you'd help me greatly by spreading the word about the the environmental aspects of uh, plant-based diets versus animal agriculture of everything try to spread the word of everything that uh, has been that I present and that would be the most that anybody could do for me um, now if you need again if you need any type of support you know by, by all means you can you can contact me by my two websites if you wanted to help support the cause we have my I have a nonprofit organization. It's called Inspire Awareness Now, um, and the website's inspireawarenessnow.org. And you can certainly you know donate to that because we don't have any other uh, funding. It's basically through very small patches of donations, and um, and it would help me spend more time to save more lives rather than because right now I'm still I mean I'm still basically practicing in, in my clinic and. Um, it give me more opportunity to, to do, like I have a list of 30 to 50 different projects that need to be accomplished with, um, with uh, combining my efforts with other world hunger organizations, as well as doing other major projects in the world for increasing uh, awareness about this. And I can't really get it off the ground without some funding of some sort. So that would help too. And so, yeah, spreading the word about my book, spreading the word about my uh, presentations and also any any little donation would help certainly and I, I hate to even ask for it but you know we it would certainly put me in a better position so that we could help where, where do we send these though because i don't believe that's in the show notes you sent me yeah so you get online the the best place is inspireawarenessnow.org and you could go online there and it has a little page of a donation page it also has you know a few other you know a few other things about what i'm doing Nice. I'm going to add that to the show notes. I just. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Jennifer says, what an amazing presentation and a wonderful man. Well, I, I, you know, it, we've been going three hours and I think you need, don't you need like a sip of water or something? I'm good. Oh, you know, I've mentioned I have Oasis. So, you know, right when I'm through here, I'm going to take some notes and, uh, and I'll drink my, uh, my little wonder liquid here. It's basically four or five different types of, of organic tea and, um, and then go uh, go meditate a little bit, and then I'm out. I'm out for working tonight on more projects. Right. Uh, Gina says, "What? Which of your books would you rec would you recommend the most, and that would reflect your presentation today?" If she wanted to give your books to her friends. Okay, you said that was Gina. That that's a really great question. I mean, it's a great question because um, comfortably unaware. First of all, I have a number of books that I've contributed to. So any of the books I've contributed to is going to be fine. But the two primary books I have is com are Comfortably Unaware. And that was written as a, as a primer. It was like a, like a quick, easy read on, a, on, an, on an airline, and, you know, like an airplane flight. And even though Ellen DeGeneres was very kind and put it on her best read list for almost a year, um, it's not, it's, it doesn't hit home with a lot of the newer, a lot of newer issues. So for a, for a primer, just for a quick read, for somebody who, who has no knowledge of any of this, I give that to them. Um, but the book that has almost everything in it that you'd want to hear or know about and reference very well is Food Choice and Sustainability. That's the one that's been used by a number of universities and colleges and 
now that's the one that's closest to my presentation. However, every presentation and, and AJ, you know this, but every presentation that I have, I update things. So this one that I have now is a very updated version up to speed with um, from that, that book even. So of the two books, uh, Food Choice and Sustainability is more of a uh, you know, science-driven, very re highly referenced book that more mimics what I'm presenting. But the presentations, this one, as well as the two that I gave for the real truth about health, those are much more detailed for um, specific uh, things that are happening today. Now, lastly, would be to just go ahead and again, like point your finger for somebody in the right direction, a, a couple of the documentaries like Food Choice, I don't think we mentioned that at the onset, but Food Choice um, or Food Choices by um, Mihao Seversky is a wonderful film for families. He takes his little young daughter around in a cart in a grocery store and starts with that. And it's, it's I mean, it's a great, a great film. And not too many people know about that one. It's called Food Choices by Mihao Seversky. And I think that's that's either on Netflix or Prime or something. You can find it. OK, so I hope, that, hope that helps a little bit. Okay, let's end, let's end on a fun question. Just so yeah. you know, almost every guest, and we've done almost a thousand shows, gets this question because people are really interested, especially somebody that's been doing this 50 years. What do you eat in a day? I know it's not fish. <laughs> no, 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 that's funny. Well, okay, so I have a bit of variety on some days, but not every day. So I'll, I'll discuss the routine that I have, which I think is, you know, most days, but then I vary quite a bit after that. But, but so... So every morning, uh, I start out with just this sort of, let's say, this magical tea, this lemon water tea thing that I have. And again, it's like four or five types of, of uh, uh, organically grown uh, loose cut teas. And then, uh, and then I might take, um, I do take a couple supplements um, only because I, when I work out real hard, I feel like I, I might need some, uh, some plant-based um, like uh, Botswellia serratas or ashwagandhas or something like that. And it's something that I also saw help tie quite a bit with uh, some things that he had when he was, you know, suffering. Um, but anyway, um, so I know it helps uh, if you're, you know, if you're running, it helps your joints, things like that. And then I eat typically at 10 to 12 grain. <laughs> it's like between eight and 12 grains of a, of a cereal uh, with, you know, usually oat milk. Lots of water, uh, but not at the same time that I eat the cereal. And then that's it for usually at lunch, I'll have a banana or something because I'm, I usually use my lunch for meditating, a little bit of yoga and running or working out. And so I can't eat just before I do that very well. I can't eat just after I do that very well. But that breakfast and maybe a fruit or something in the middle of the day, um, and I also eat like a, you probably appreciate this too, but I eat like a fistful or two of, which is pretty dense of squash down kale or collard greens or, you know, a mixture of that. So I'll eat that. Sometimes I'll have that for breakfast, um, but I'll eat that, you know, somewhere around the banana time. And it really gets me going for the, all, the, all the rest of the day. So that's basically all I have until at, at night. And then um, eating when I get home, um, I'll have uh, uh, all sorts of different things. And it's basically whatever my lovely wife, Jill, <laughs> wants to prepare that night. Cause I, I will, I mean, that's not Chauvinisky. She's just, she's the chef of the, she's the chef, chef AJ as close as I could get, you know, to, and she's, and she's at my house and she's wonderful. So it's usually, and she, she will come up with a mixture, a very wonderful mixture of some ancient grains, whether it's quinoa, kamut, or, you know, sometimes buckwheat or, you know, um, a number of different grains with, again, we will never miss, uh, a day without uh, a heavy amount of greens. I mean, we'll go through bunches of greens and steam very lightly. You already know about this. Um, and then, well, many times, I mean, I know Dr. McDougall will appreciate this, but many times we'll just have a, a, a potato. I mean, nothing on it. I mean, just a, I just a potato, just, so I mean, just a potato. I'll just eat a potato. <laughs> I do too. Uh, I mean, do you? Yeah. I mean, just, I you mean, know. they're great. They're like, oh, they're fantastic. Perfect finger food. Maybe Jill will come on the show and do a cooking demonstration. <laughs> She's uh, that's really wonderful to say. She, she loves people, but she would be so nervous, probably like 
I mean, she'd cook her finger or something, or she, she's so nervous about, you know, it's so funny, gonna... you know, the speak of the devil, cut, cut, I don't like that saying either, but, uh, <laughs> cut, you know, um, I, I, I had a show at 2 PM today, but while you were talking, I mean, it's okay that it went over the, the gentleman that was supposed to do the cooking demo, literally cut the tip of his finger off Nick from local spicery. So let's oh, all, no. I know. Oh, he, sorry to hear that. Oh, I know. I know. I mean, it, I mean, it worked out. Okay. But I feel yeah. terrible. So everybody buy some spices at local spicery. That's right. Help out. Yeah, that's right. Help, help a man out. Uh, do you want to run for president? Asks Angela. <laughs> you know, I uh, my wife asked me that all the time because I actually was president of my student council through junior high to get in high school, uh, you know, and then. Uh, so the short answer is I, I would absolutely love to be in a position where I could make a difference. I mean, and that that I think is one of the big but. I'd probably be pretty, pretty frustrated with, you know, the, 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 all the channels you have to go through to get some things done. Um, but yeah, I mean, if somebody could just transplant me or, or transfer me over into that position, um, and I believe we could, we could then make a huge difference in the world. So yeah, the short answer is I wouldn't have any problem doing that at all. Yeah. You and Neil Barnard on the same ticket. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that yeah, was see, funny. and I, and I wouldn't have any problem uh, energy wise at all, you know, uh, doing everything that's needed, but also making sure we had an agenda for um, the health of our, our citizens, the health of our global society and the health of our planet. So no question. Right. Well, I'm going to let you go because you have to write a letter to Greta Thunberg now. I do. I do. I've got that on my note right here. <laughs> so yeah. This has just been such a delightful uh, three hours. Seriously, it just flew by. And I hope people will share this presentation with their friends, loved ones, and even everyone not necessarily their loved ones because it's so important it is important and thank you i can't thank you enough uh aj you're just you're just a beautiful person and uh you're doing so many great things so this is this has been my honor and my privilege to be here so thank you so much for everything thank you dr openlander and thanks all of you for watching another episode of chef aj live please come back tomorrow when my guest is dr shika mercha and she is from docs in the kitchen so we'll, we'll, we'll today we had environment tomorrow we'll have doctor and cooking we'll satisfy everyone's need for excellent everything take care dr openlander